Hey everyone, hope all is well. My name is Miles Dyer and welcome to the Quest for Global Empathy. I am so excited to be doing this right now. For about eight years, I've wanted to launch my very own podcast show, but I wanted to do it when the moment was right, when my ideas could come to fruition in a way that felt effective. And that's where we are today. And so thanks to Creators for Change, an initiative by YouTube that I've been a part of the last couple of years, they've given me funding to get the ball rolling. I've been able to find a studio, equip it, get a good team, and here we are. And this is going to be an interesting journey. Um, thanks to your feedback, um, I'm able to improve this and this will evolve over time. And so thank you for tuning in and uh, I look forward to seeing where this goes. And after the initial four episodes, um, it's then up to us as an online community. If you like what you see or hear with this podcast, then please check out patreon.com forward slash Miles Dyer, where you can donate as little as $1 a month. And if we hit our target, um, we can keep making these. So today I'm joined by um, an, a hilarious guest, who I've had the pleasure of having many conversations with the past couple of years through Creators for Change, because he too is an ambassador for that. He is a British actor, comedian and writer, best known for his web series, Diaries of a Bad Man. His name is Hamza Ashad, and he joins me now. How you doing, dude? I'm all right, man. It's, it, was a, it was a bit of a, a long drive, but yeah. it's worth it. I was definitely excited to be a part of this. And whereabouts yeah. do you live? You in central London? Yeah, I live in. No, I live in South Central London. I yeah. wish. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, driving in central London is not normally yeah, a combination. Yeah, yeah. We actually have to go in central London late on. It's, it's the it's the worst thing ever, isn't it? It's like you have to think of congestion charge. Then you have to think. I actually heard that there's certain roads you can't even go on now or soon unless you're like a electric car or something. Really? Yeah. So I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I like. I got a car, let me use it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, no, I live in South London. Okay. Uh, near Streatham, okay. Melbury. So it's around the M25? Um, yeah, well, yeah. it's ki kind oh. of, yeah. So but, uh, um, For global audiences, the M25 is a, a freeway, as you'd call it, that goes all the way around London. Yeah. An unreliable one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> With a lot of traffic, yeah. Yeah, and like during the Olympics, I think they shut down like two of the lanes and yeah. it was just absolutely I think manic. that's just a casual thing to oh. be honest, isn't it? It's like, yeah. oh, let's, let's piss some people off. Yeah. Let's close a few lanes, you know that's what I mean? exactly Banter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. And I... I would never wish on my worst enemy driving in London. Oh. I think there's one time that my band played in Camden. Yeah. And in Camden especially, it's all one-way streets. Oh, yeah, And yeah, the, yeah. the sat-nav yeah. does not... It takes you down the wrong way sometimes. That's the thing. Like, when you go through central London, the sat-nav finishes. Mm. Like, it fully... It's like, I don't want to work anymore. And then... You, you're on your own now. Yeah, and you're literally... <laughs> and, and, you know, I hate... The, the worst thing about TomToms is, like... When you put it on and you don't know whether you're supposed to go that way or that way, and you'll know in three, four seconds where you got like if you're right. going the wrong way or not, because it the will start be of like... the journey is the worst <laughs> bit because it's always pointing a random way. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, but um, yeah, and no, I've been in South London all my life. Um, yes, yeah, it's it's, it's uh, it was it's it's weird because my uh, my neighbourhoods, it's like this is the best thing about well not the best thing about London, but the craziest thing is it's like I live in a really nice area. But then if you walk down the road for like 30 seconds to like, let's just say a minute max, yeah. it's completely different. Really? And South London's very, um, uh, it's very rough. But I, I like it. I yeah. like it because I think that when I was growing up, it kind of, it, it made me, um, it, it, is it hardened me up? It does that sure. sound right? And you become sounds, straight wise. Sounds sexual. It? Sorry. Yeah. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah. It's just, yeah. It kind of, um, it just, it was, it was a good experience actually. I, I was actually happy that like, even one of the schools that I, I went to and I, I grew up in, um, it was rough. Like every day there'd be police cars, really? there'd be this or that, or whatever, stabbing outside or, wow. you know, gang fire, whatever it was. Um, but yeah, it actually it just, I don't know, like, because I was just thrown into that kind of world, I just learned so much. Sure. And I liked it because I was like, I'd rather that than going to like, you know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a private school or, you know, a really nice school. Obviously, there's more benefits in that, I guess. But at the same time, it just kind of showed me a different side to reality. So as as I was growing up, I was more street smart. And I sure. That was a, quite a cool part of my life. Yeah. I think it is good just having that variety because yeah. um, I, I've had a weird mix. So I went to a state primary school. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, my dad's story was he started off as a, a mechanic for British Airways and oh, then yeah. he worked up and became quite senior in a health company. And so, like, he's a real inspiration to me of, like, really worked for it. Yeah. And so my secondary school was private school. I felt like a complete outcast there. Like, yeah. um, I, I was like, I'm not academic. And <laughs> there was a lot of pressure because then you have to really perform to sort of keep with that. But it was interesting in having that mix. And actually, I think, and I'm sure you'll relate to this, whenever you do videos on YouTube, yeah. uh, one of the most common comments you get is get a real job. Yeah. And I just want to like get out my CV and go, look, I've worked in construction as a labourer. Wow, you know, yeah. I have worked for the BBC and The Guardian. Yeah, yeah. But I've also, you know, s stacked shelves at Tesco's or sold carpets for like a department store. Like, yeah. I've, I've had a good mixture. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and also, I think with my accent as well, I've always had people make fun of me either because to some I sound especially when I was in construction yeah. they thought I sounded too posh okay and yeah, then yeah. when I'm with people that are you know well spoken yeah. because I don't pronounce my t's they think I sound too common it's, and it's, it's I'm like <laughs> yeah. in this weird middle it's ground it's so weird how like I mean it's so weird how so many of us um experience not fitting in right like as an example like you're saying that now I'm like like here like especially when I was growing up you know, it's obviously racism still exists, but, you know, back it then it was... It does? Yeah, I think so. I haven't People, had any recently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, with, with, the, with me, I was like, okay, sometimes, like, when I'm in this country, you know, you feel kind of like an outsider. You, do, you don't feel... You want to say, oh, you know, I'm British. I was born in this country. I was, you know, raised in this country. And, um, you know, sometimes some, like, certain people will make you feel that you don't belong here. And then I go to Pakistan... And, you know, that's for me, you know, it should be my home. It's where my parents are from. It's my roots. It's, it's, it's my culture. And I'm there. And, then, and I remember, like, I, we live in a small village um, in Jhelum. Um, and it's beautiful. It's absolutely, like, a lot of people have this kind of, uh, kind of like this vision of Pakistan and how <laughs> it looks. And it's just like, right. you know, like, just loads of, you know, little barefoot kids just running about and, <laughs> and just sewers and stuff. It's not, well, actually, that is Pakistan. But there's some <laughs> nice parts as well. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're, like, in the middle of nowhere um like just fields everywhere and um and i remember once i i came back and i don't think the story has a point actually to be honest so i'm kind of scared talking about the story because i don't know where i'm going but i just remember there was one point where there were so many kids and we were playing football and in my head i was like oh you know you're going to be all rubbish i'm you know i'm sick of football i'm from you know south london and and that was true because they were they were horrible horrible <laughs> they were really bad they they can play cricket really well but football they were just they didn't understand the concept they, one person said oh is it more it's more pleasurable to score a goal really close to the line i said no it's not actually it's the other way around but anyway uh, carry on just wear some socks and um but i remember they like would like look at me like i don't belong here right they, they kept calling me english follower which means the uh, i think it, the you know the english one you know and um and it was such a shame because i was like so many of us just we we just asked but we feel that there's not actually a right place where we actually fit you're right you know and it's, and, it's a weird feeling isn't it and as the world is diversifying more it's harder to find that more concrete identity but i think it goes more fundamental than just about like your heritage you know, a generation ago, you would have a job for life. Mm, um, mm. I, I tell this story quite a lot, but I'll never forget when I worked for a department store. Um, it was one of my first jobs. And in the electrical department, we celebrated, I think it was one of my colleagues. It was her, I think it was 40th or 50th year working there. Oh, wow. So on the one hand, I was like, huge respect. On the other hand, yeah. I was like, the idea of working somewhere for 40, 50 yeah. years terrifies me. Yeah, yeah. But... That was just the way it is. It's also in terms of relationships yeah. or having a house for life. Like these are very static forms of, you know, that it's security in a lifestyle, yeah. which doesn't exist anymore. Like mm. it, the, the cliche of when you go for a job and they say, where do you see yourself in 10 years time? Mm. I always want to turn the question, although I wouldn't, I wouldn't get the job. But yeah. you, you, you want to say, where do you see the world in a month? Yeah. Like we have no idea. Yeah, yeah. And I think that causes people to want to latch on to identity in some kind. And, and it's why people, yeah. I think at the moment, really want to go back to traditions. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the the world is a lot more complicated. And as you say, people have an idea of what Pakistan is like. Yeah. And that might uh, uh, you know be true of some areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the world is complicated and yeah. we can't deal with the complicated nature. So some people will look at me and go, I'm a posh boy. And others will go, oh, I'm just... Yeah. common and it's like it's crazy yeah I mean, it's it's it's, it's I, I think that even when i was growing up i just 
But I think that's one one thing that I loved about London is like, you know, we're one of the most diverse cities in the world. And growing up, I just met so many different types of people, and it just made me kind of like appreciate and 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 kind of like respect life and and people um because you're growing up with different like i remember um when i was uh when i was in school um there was hardly any uh i hardly had any white friends right. uh because it was majority um black or asian uh and then i remember when i went to croydon college uh, predominantly all my friends were black and then i went to kingston college uh and then um i think that was a much crazier mix of like all these different kind of uh, people coming from different parts of the world. Yeah. And then I went to drama school in Richmond and I was the only colored person there and everyone else was white. Right. Uh, and I, but I had to, I think it's just about adapting to your kind of environment really, isn't it? It's like, it's just a, a kind of, yeah, just, I think you, as a person, you have to kind of change uh, uh, to the surroundings near you. You have to just kind of, have that flexibility of just trying to cater for the environment around you and, and tweak yourself. Yes. So you kind of never know who you are, where you actually belong, because it's not really about you. It's about where you are. Yeah, yeah. You know? you're right. And it is about always being sort of one foot out of your comfort zone. And I think the prob people run into issues where if they have been comfortable living a life of stability, whether mm. it's where they live or the, pe the community they're in, and then it changes around them, mm all at once or very quickly, that's where a lot of these issues kick up. Whereas us, we've lived in a world where for YouTube now, the <laughs> people from, I mean, this sounds ridiculous. I'm friends with some people in, online who we don't speak the same language, but we've yeah. had conversations with Google Translate. That's crazy. Which is, is crazy. Shout out Google. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's like, uh, and we've hung out and like, and sometimes we've hung out, we've gone yeah. for a drink while they're in the country and we'll be chatting using Google Translate. That's which crazy. Sounds, but, and I know that technology will move on yeah. eventually so yeah. we don't have to type it in and it will yeah. be, I think they've already created a device. Technologies, that, I can't keep up now. Yeah. Like I remember, I, I was like, and this is such a small thing, but I had the 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 Google um, what's it called the oh they've given me a hundred for free, so I should really know the name. <laughs> you know that little thing. It's like is it Lex? Not Lexi, but was Chrome? Is it? Oh Chrome, yeah. Is what you can Chrome? put on your oh no, it's the no. like Hello Google thing. Yeah, yeah. It's basically a cast, the, the, cast, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, I think Google Cast. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's that. Yeah. It's like the uh, Alexa. The, That's the, exactly. the Amazon equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you hear about the Alexa? The 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 laugh. Oh yeah, the creepy laugh in the middle of the night. Yeah, uh, uh, if that happened to me, I would I would just start punching air. I would go crazy. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have one because yeah. I don't trust. Because when yeah. I heard that story, I just literally just unplugged it. Right. Even at night time, I feel really uneasy. Like, like you hear all these conspiracy theories. Um, sorry, it's a podcast. We were going to get to conspiracy yeah, no, theories. We will. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, yeah. But anyway, back, let me <laughs> go back to my point. So I had that, and I remember um, once I just basically said, "Oh." Um, uh, what's my name? And because it's uh, connected to my uh, Google Pixel, uh, which got free as well, um, <laughs> uh, uh, the perks of being an ambassador. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, they basically, well, she said, yeah, you know, um, your name's Hamza Rashad. I was like, oh, wicked. So I said, oh, what's my mom's name? And she was like, um, oh, uh, you haven't told me your mom's name. If you tell me, maybe I'd remember. So I was like, all right, cool. So I, t I, t I told um, my mom's name's Noreen. So um, I said, oh, her name's Noreen. Three, four days later, I, my mum was like nearby, so I said, oh, come in here for a second. And I, and I said, uh, oh, Pixel, um, what is my mum's name? And um, she just turned around and said, oh, well, you told me that it's Noreen, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's a bit of a mind, like, uh, that's like, it, it really got to me. I was like, okay, maybe like some people are like, what? But that's that's the start of oh, yeah. AI. That's like... You know that's that film with Will Smith when the robots went crazy. <laughs> this is the beginning. Do you know what I mean? Like she remembered my. It's crazy. I think that... no AI is a very worrying thing, and it's all about if we. It's the whole genie out of the bottle. It's yeah. do we put the constraints in early enough? Yeah. But the point is, unfortunately, that there are going to be people in the world that go. Forget the constraints. If yeah. we want to have a competitive edge, we should just make the smartest ever. Yeah, yeah. But there are stories in the world right now, and I kid you not. Um, people doing experiments with AI and what they do is they set up the AI program that they've created because yeah. the misconception is people think AI will become a problem when we create one that is smarter than us yeah. as in has more info but it's not it's when we create an AI that can learn to learn because yeah. when it can learn to learn it will be an exponential growth yeah. of information yeah, yeah. so that there are people in the world right now that have AI on a machine 
and they disconnect it from the internet. And the, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. But they feed it information bit by bit to see if it becomes curious. Okay. And the reason they disconnect it from the internet is because they're worried if it does learn to learn, it might escape through the internet. Wow. And it could like basically absorb all the information online. That... It, it could literally download itself probably onto a 3D printer, make itself in physical form. That's uh... literally genuinely crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like I hear like, <laughs> like this, I was, uh, YouTube's a crazy place. Like I was seeing this kind of thing where like they're making like sex bots now. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, like, I, I, okay, the blow up dolls were the, were the thing probably back in the 80s. <laughs> but now, like, were they going to talk to me now? And stuff? that's weird. And I saw this one program where the guy's married. Yes. But yeah. he's with, have you seen that? Yes. Yeah, and, but he's got a sex doll, and, but he's got kids. I know. And, and, they, and they speak to, to the, 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 the AI. Bot. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, what kind of family is? You never get that in a Pakistani home. <laughs> we might be running barefoot like everywhere and getting caught up on our foot, but we're not, we're not having sex with machines. I'm just Me saying. No, technology is like a mirror of our humanity of like what we do. I mean, there was a book that came out recently. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it basically talks through the, the, the most popular search results and it's how most people would be disgusted about, you know, what people search for and yeah. what their habits are. But it's also the fact, and, and this is where my interest in civil liberties comes in, which is most people, but a lot of policymakers think the internet is just a form of communication, yeah. but it's also about discovering who we are. Yeah. Um, so you might search something online, which is controversial. You know, I might even search ISIS online because yeah. I want to find out about for them. Bands, yeah. uh, or for bands, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Especially for bands, yeah. yeah. Uh, they have a pretty uh, good way of making videos. <laughs> yeah. um, good music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, you'd search that. And then if that was used out of context, they, yeah. and you know you wanted to be done by someone who had that information, they go, look, you were searching. 100%. And so this is why we need to be careful yeah. in the long run. See, I'm all right. Because since, <laughs> since young, I always used to clear my history. So I think I'm on top of it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty good But they good say at that it. doesn't even matter now. Oh, that's... Because it's saved that? on the other end. This is horrible, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. This is horrible. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but it, it is actually scary. Like, I think... I think... This is the thing. Like, we live social media. You know, we have to. It's a, it's yeah. part of our job. But I, I think that... It's just... It's like... One of the best things that's ever happened to humanity. But this... At the same time, I feel it's our down, downfall because it's like, I, I remember I was with the, uh, like a yogi and a load, my mate and uh, loads of my other mates. And we hadn't met for a very long time. This was quite a few years back, actually. And this is when I first kind of noticed how um, phones were taking over uh, because now on your phone, you can do anything. You know, yeah. you could literally do anything like, you know, you want a compass, it could be on the phone, you want to take a picture, you want to listen to music, you, you don't, want to record a Most video. people don't use it for what phones are made for. Yeah, like, yeah exactly. I don't call people. I know, <laughs> like it, it does everything else. It's crazy. And and um, and I remember like I was with a, a big group of friends and uh, we were together in, in, in one place just chilling and we hadn't seen each other for a while. So we had a lot to catch up on. And I remember for a split second, I was just checking my phone. And then I looked up, and there's, there's about 10 of us here, by the way. And I looked up, and literally everyone was just glued to their phone in silence, just tapping away. Now, this is 10 people, yeah, that haven't yeah. seen each other for such a long time. And I turned around and I said, guys, like, it, we could have just all stayed at home and WhatsApped each other. Do you know what I mean? Like, we don't even need to be here. And I made this rule. I said, okay, uh, everyone puts their phone on the table. Whoever looks at the phone, we said that you can see the screen. So if your mum calls you or your girl, it's fine. Yeah. You've got like a two minute window slot. <laughs> okay. But apart from that, whoever touches their phone first has to pay for the whole thing. Now, everyone's Pakistani. They don't want to be paying that kind of money. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like we, we, we got more like stuff to pay for. So yeah, we, um, we spent two hours with, our f with the phones on our table. No one was allowed to touch it. And I swear to you, this was like four or five years ago. Right. But I still remember it because it was one of the best conversations I've right. ever had with my friends. Yeah. Now, imagine I could be having that on a daily basis. But no, like, no matter what, we are just so comfortable. 
and it's just like we're programmed just to get on our phone and we just zone out. Sure. And it's I've been off social media for three weeks now. I've never done nearly nearly a month. I've never done it before. And, and don't get it twisted. Like sometimes when you take some really nice pictures and you put the right filter, you're like, oh, this would bang on on yeah. Instagram. But then at the same time, I'm, I feel so good. Because I, you I feel f- free as well. I like, feel free, and you're like, "Why did I do this?" Because I, I remember when I worked in I worked in France at a ski resort, um, just on my gap year before going to university oh, nice. for half a year. It was it was like both my one of my best experiences, but one of my worst. Okay, because I was like the youngest there, and I was just like picked on for being the youngest, and like I'd never been away from home for more than two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it definitely made me grow as a person. Like when I went to university, yeah. most people weren't able to do their own laundry and stuff. And it was like, I had to take care of myself. Yeah, yeah, But yeah. the reason I brought it up was because um, when I was there, there was not much internet. You had to pay at the internet cafe. And it was when MySpace was a big oh thing. Oh my God, MySpace. Yeah, and so when I got home, I was just like, I didn't use it. Like I used to go on every day. I used yeah. to refresh the homepage to see how someone commented on a photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now <laughs> what's happened is every time you get another Apple website, uh, you you know have MySpace and Facebook, so you check MySpace, then Facebook, then you go. Oh, I have to check MySpace now. And as you have more and more apps, yeah. you have more reason to yeah, go back to the yeah. beginning. And it's yeah. like this addiction. Yeah. And I was like, I don't feel the need to use MySpace. Yeah. But then as I started using it, you get hooked in again. Yeah. You and do. so when you take those breaks, um, you, you're right. It is freedom. Yeah. And because I, I remember you posting the other day about wanting to take a break from it. And yeah. I mean, I've deleted Twitter off my phone. It's one of the best things I've ever done. Yeah. Because it's just a constant stream of conversation. It's not good for anxiety. Yeah. Um, your brain doesn't switch off. Yeah. And I think there must be something unhealthy about seeing a constant stream where it will be something from like, could be a comment about sport and then, you know, something happening in Syria and then it yeah. could be something about Brexit and your brain is having to access different yeah, like, Twitter, parts Twitter's of dangerous. Yeah, I, I, I just... I'm scared. So, like, I, I don't use Twitter anymore because I'm like, if I, if I say anything that's wrong, like, everyone's going to see. And that's horrible. And it's, especially in this day and age, everyone is so super sensitive. Yeah. It's like, I'm a comedian. Yeah. So it's even harder for me because sure. obviously our job is to kind of, you know, take the piss a bit. Um, but yeah, Twitter is so dangerous because you can throw out your opinion, but sometimes it doesn't even feel like you have the right to have an opinion if it's offensive to someone. Right, right, you right. You know, you, like no matter what. Like, and I think that's kind of a shame as well. And I, yeah. Uh, I've always, I've always regarded it as a platform of anti-nuance. Yeah, and yeah, it's why yeah. people get angry because what you do is you have this big idea you want to communicate yeah, yeah. and you're shoving it in a funnel. Of, yeah. I don't know how many characters it is now, but it was like, it used to be 120, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so if you're trying to shove all that thought into 120 characters, yeah, yeah. it's not going to be nuanced or well thought out. It's going to be like the the point of it. How, what is it now? How many characters is it? Like two something, isn't it? AI, is it two, man. Yeah, yeah, AI, yeah. it's mad. <laughs> but I just, I don't bother. But you're right about also people judging you and anything you said. I, I, I'm sure there is stuff on my Twitter feed from when I first started, which yeah. is bad. And yeah. I'll, I will be called out in it one day and people will say I'm a terrible person. Yeah. But that is why I think we have a responsibility now to say mm. we're not perfect. Like I've, I've put my hands out. A story um, I, I tell a lot of people, and I've not done it on the podcast yet, so I'll tell it now. But like when I first started YouTube 12 years ago, I did like comedy sketches here and yeah. there, not particularly good ones, especially this one I'm about to mention. Okay. And I did um, parodies of different YouTubers. Yeah. And there was a, uh, a YouTuber who was a fashion guru. Okay. Um, I'll say his name. His name was William Sled, and he went on to be on TV and then, and he did amazing stuff. Um, and so I did uh, a sketch of him, and I didn't know him personally, um, but I did a comedy sketch um, just making fun of the way he behaved and stuff like that. Um, and I uploaded it and it did quite well amongst my circle of friends, people saying it was funny. Yeah. And then I sent it to him and I was like, Hey William, I made this. what do you think? And I didn't hear back. Uh, and back then we used a live streaming website called Stickham. Okay. And, uh, he was live one day. And so I went into his room. I was like, Oh, Hey, hey Will, it's miles. I made that sketch. What did you think of it? And he went, Oh yeah, I was totally mortified like by it. And like instantly I felt so bad yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was like, I'm so sorry. I deleted it. Yeah. I followed up with a message apologizing. We didn't speak again, but we didn't really speak much anyway. Yeah. And I know without doubt in hindsight, it was a homophobic video. Mm. Some of the gags mm. um, about him being very camp mm. in uh, it, it was completely homophobic. And you know what? Um, I deleted it. There's every chance it could be found and someone would upload it one day. Mm. And that 12 years ago of me will be used to judge me now. Yeah. But I would condemn it. 
yeah. and I would be mortified if yeah. that was put up now because it was disgusting yeah, yeah. and it came from a place of ignorance. There was no malice in it. Yeah. And I think it's why we have to be careful about where intention lies because yeah. we all make mistakes. And the problem we have in our world today is if every time someone makes a mistake, we say you're an evil person yeah. or you, you are a bad person. Yeah, yeah. And I speak a lot before about, I don't think there's such thing as about being a good or bad person. Yeah, you're yeah. a mixed bag. And, you know, we believe like an apple can turn bad, but a bad yeah, yeah. apple can't go good. But we're human beings. We can improve. Yeah, 100%. And if you are just going to say someone's bad, you're basically defining them and you're not giving them room to improve. Yeah. And so I, I've definitely, even when I was like in primary school, that I told racist jokes. Mm. And I know it. And actually, I remember the first time uh, when I stopped and I must have been really little, like... Yeah. 10 or maybe a bit younger but I was at a park telling a racist joke and this guy it, you did it because you got the laughs and yeah, there was yeah, this yeah. power play with it and um, this um, guy said oh yeah tell it to my mate um, and he was of he was of um, Asian origin yeah, and I yeah. told this racist joke and I saw him just go like dead serious oh, no, yeah, and in horrible. that moment it was like just empathy in that moment yeah, of yeah. like this is the consequence of you telling a joke like yeah. I got the laughs when you did it in the playground and in that moment, it was like, yeah. ne never again. And I remember apologizing there, but his mate was like laughing and I just saw it in his face. And it was just like, that's how you learn in life. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah, it's all right that I learned it. That caused him a bit of pain in that moment. Yeah. And that's terrible. But what I was do... the joke? I can't remember. I can't, well, you I can't... do, do. You do. Go on Google. They know. <laughs> yeah, go on Google. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, I tell the joke. It'll, I, I, it'll can't, bang. I can't remember the specific joke. And, and, even, if I, and even if I did, I wouldn't repeat it. thumbnail yeah. of an Asian guy. Just... But the fact you say that and I feel like really tense inside is because it's, um, it's traumatic to think that I was a human being that did that. And it's yeah. because when I look back in my past life, there are things that I don't identify myself as being today because we change and we learn. Do you and, think, though that people are way too, like a bit too sensitive because I feel like if there's malice in a joke, sure. then hundred percent, I think, you know, like with me, I, I'm a comedian because I want to make people laugh and sure. feel good. So obviously if you do the opposite, um, that's completely like going against what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. So then I, I feel like I'm a failure. So I've always tried to keep that balance and I never want to offend anyone. But nowadays, like people would get offended over anything. You know, like any anything, like you know. I, I... Do you know what it is though? I, I I do wonder to what extent that is true because I think there will always be someone online who says I'm offended, and yeah. that's what the media will pick up yeah, and say, yeah, "Look yeah. at these offended." I think there's this massive middle ground of people that just want to be like, whatever. Like I didn't find that joke funny, yeah, yeah. but it's the loud voices are going to be the people that want to offend, like yeah, yeah. for offence sake, yeah, 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 yeah. and those that are I've been offended, yeah. and or I've been triggered, yeah. and and all this sort of stuff. So, but yeah, in terms of sensitivity, I, I yeah, I think there's no doubt that people are more sensitive on certain issues yeah. these days. But I think it's also because we're making a lot of progress in terms of. I, I agree. Ethics yeah, and, yeah, no, I agree with that. And, yeah, yeah. and I think that might be, and, and as a result, unfortunately, yeah. you are getting people that are, I think in a way, the people that are most sensitive are probably making progress for us all, but they're, I guess, yeah, I they're, guess they're sort saying, of, yeah. they're punching far yeah. and it's like, we don't want to go that far, mm. but by them doing it, it yeah. is making us move along. It's a weird one. I think we're definitely learning. Like I'm learning every day, yeah. you know, and I think, you know, sometimes when you, when you like, uh, like as an example, even, I mean, I don't really get any uh, backlash, but I, you know, sl for us slang back in the day, uh, like just on road, like if you, if you, if you didn't like anything, you'd be like, oh, that's gay. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't actually, even though in essence it's kind of, you know. It, yeah, it's it, homophobic, yeah, but, it, but it, homophobic, it was never meant. But it was or, slang, yeah. you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, like slang would be so weird. Like you would, you if you compliment something and like something, you say it's sick, which is kind of meaning the opposite. Right. So it was, it's, it's so weird, but it was just slang. Uh, but then obviously when I, when I grew up, I was like, oh, okay. In maybe in South London, people would understand that. But now when you're appealing to so many people, you know, and especially like back then, like it, I had like a small group of friends and, 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 and two of the, two of them obviously the sexuality was you know different they were you know they're gay so i didn't want to upset them so i was like oh the more people that watch this i have to be even like i have to think about uh it, not just on in my world what i you know feel is okay and what isn't but yeah at the same time like what other people like because when you do a youtube video someone in in thailand or or or, 
or Korea, maybe not North Korea, or was it South Korea? Which one's a bad one? Uh, North yeah, whatever. Korea. Yeah, that's one. Kim Jong Un, that one. Yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, like people like in all these different parts of the world that will have a, a different kind of like uh, mindset. And sure. They, yeah, and I think that's quite. But I, I definitely do agree with you. I think that at the same time as well, being more careful uh, makes us kind of uh, be uh, kind of more kind of. Uh, knowledgeable about other people's kind sure. of feelings and and we conduct ourselves better uh, knowing that you know we're basically watching where we're stepping on which is I think really important but at the same time like I don't know if you saw uh, Dave Chappelle's um, Dave Chappelle's uh, three part episode yeah. on Netflix and I'm, he, a, I'm a huge fan of Dave Chappelle yeah. but I know the controversies that I, came with it I love Dave Chappelle yeah, yeah. But one thing Dave Chappelle said to me actually saddened me. He actually said that I don't know how long I'm going to be doing this because everyone's uh, everyone's a pussy now, you know. Right. And but at the same time, you're like, you understand that t- times are changing. But then he's such a great and like, I get his material and to know that maybe comedy after maybe. Five, ten, fifteen years would never be like that. Right, right. It's it's kind of sad. Well, it know? was it was the article yeah. about um, again. I, I'm sure this was just a hyperbolic headline. Millennials mm. find yeah, uh, friends yeah. homophobic. Yeah, and it's a weird one of like, again, put the head so- uh, the the headline aside. If there were people that watched that and were offended, yeah. that's fine. I don't think there was the outrage because what they do is they do that article yeah. and then the people go, political correctness gone mad. Yeah, yeah. And then people go, but it's not political correctness. And then that's the yeah. furore they want. But I think if there are people that watch that and go, yeah, I didn't find those jokes particularly funny. Yeah. That's like, there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah, of and, course. But what people should realize is if we look back even five years and go, that was totally unacceptable. Like even if we talk about like, James Bond and how he treated women. Yeah. Which some of it you're just like, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. I think we have to be careful not to say it should be deleted off platforms. Yeah. The reason that you find it offensive is because of how much progress we've made. Yeah. In a weird way, if we're ever going to make progress. It's history, if anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And because, you learn by yeah, looking at it. Yeah, because you can watch back like 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And when you, when you especially with film, and you know when you're just looking at the writing and kind of like the, the storylines and the kind of like the the villains and you sure. know stuff like you can learn so much from the mindset of of that era and that that's quite as i said that's kind of a um that's kind of cool in terms of like knowing where we are now as a civilization yeah you know, like how much we have progressed because that's so funny like yeah like there's so many things that i'd watch now it's like Hey, that's pretty sexist. You know what I mean? That's really bad. Like, yeah. you know, and 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 you we would never get away with, you know, like I don't think anyone would want to kind of like write that kind of material or anything unless, you know, it was like some serious drama that was trying to make a point. But um yeah, no, I th- I do agree with you though. It's just uh, I wa- are changing. I watched on BBC on iPlayer they did like a selection of like old game show, classic game shows. One of them was the Jim Davidson Big Break, the Snooker yeah, program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Firstly, I don't know who chose to put that episode up there. I don't get shocked very easily. I cannot believe it. So during it, because in the middle of the show, they get one of the contestants to um, come to the front and then they do a trick shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had this young girl that came up and Jim Davidson was like openly flirting with her and stuff like that. And it was really creepy and awkward. Yeah. And then he got the mum to come on stage to help with the trick shot. And I don't know if he, I can't remember exactly if he was flirting with her or with the girl still. And some people go, oh, it was just a joke. It's like, yeah. that's just not. It's a bit weird, isn't I, it? I just, I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, it's just really bizarre. Yeah. But but the question I've always had for myself is, I'm worried because we're seeing all this progress. Am I, are things I say now, uh, or am I going to be a bigot of the future? Like, are there going to be issues that I can't change with? Yeah. But I'm hopeful because I think the rate of change yeah. is so quick now, going back to the thing about like, not having a job for life, a home yeah. for life. Even with ideas, we're having to evolve so quickly that... That's actually crazy though. Like yeah. you're saying that how people may watch this in the future <laughs> yeah, and, and think, be like, wow, how could they be saying this? Or, you never yeah. know. Like no. their mindset might be completely different. But if they're watching right now, I'm just saying having sex with robots is, is wrong, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? You need to stop that. You know so what you're, I mean? you're, you're going to be called a bigot because there's going to be robots that are AI going. It is what it is. Do you know what I mean? Robots are going to be saying... I'm not banging metal. That's weird. 
Okay, and there's you know gonna be I mean? robots that are calling you a bigot now because they go, "We deserve whatever, man." <laughs> uh, I hope you run out of battery. You know what I mean? <laughs> See, I worry about that. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen the clip of them testing with the robots, and there's the robot that carries the box, yeah, yeah. and this guy has a hockey stick, and he like knocks the box out hard, oh, and then wow. the robot's struggling to pick it up again, and he's like pushing it away just to show jokes. how good it is at keeping its balance. <laughs> and I'm like, I would destroy that tape <laughs> because in 10, 15, 20 years of the future, a robot's gonna <laughs> see that tape, scan his face, yeah, yeah, and he's yeah. gonna be like. <laughs> An old man at home, knock at the door, robot with a hockey stick, <laughs> and put him in a box. You know, it's so funny, you're, you're, you know, you're talking about um, creepy game shows. Yeah. Have you seen that YouTube video of that little, uh, no, that guy who kept kissing little kids? Have you seen that one? No. It was really weird. It was like, oh, I need to find out. I saw the link and I was like, he, he kept asking little you know, kids, little girls and whatever. Like I have seen yeah, I have seen yeah. Have you seen it? But it's like a really old game show, wasn't it, Clip? But yeah, but that's... I, I, I'm not saying, and therefore yeah. it was all right. <laughs> it was five, no, no, I mean, it was like, yeah, yeah. it was a 70s, it was on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. I thought, yeah. He was like, can I have a kiss? It was, yeah. If that was, well, if someone was trying to say that to my little daughter, I'd be, I'd be like, where's the hockey stick? Or I'd get my sex bot to attack him. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Your sex for it. Yeah, well, oh. <laughs> shit, man. It's a podcast. Everyone's going to come, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, I was just doing reverse psychology. But, but but that's the thing. Stuff that was done on TV then, yeah. it was shown once and that was it. Mm. You didn't have catch up. And so... Yeah, but now we have YouTube. And, and, and that's it. And everything is now forever. Yeah. And I, I think the only things that used to be immortal was um, like photos. Yeah. But a photo wouldn't really tell a story other than, you know, people, you know, yeah. getting around smiling. Now... If someone sees a video from me 10 years ago, like every so often I have to check my old videos and think, do I still agree with it now? Because yeah. although I'd love to keep it up and sort of show this is how I've evolved as a person, yeah. a part of me feels like, well, someone could load that now and go, how do you explain this, Miles? Mm. And I'd have, and, and this is the thing, and I think it's why we need more people coming forward and saying we're not perfect. Yeah. And it's not to excuse it, because I think we live in a world now where people are so scared to admit they're wrong. It's why, especially on Twitter, if someone says something wrong, everyone goes yeah, for them. Yeah. Because I think they're scared of like, if the attention's not on me, yeah. it's on someone else. And yeah. it's why this like mob mentality, it's like, I, this is my way of like acknowledging that this kind of thing exists in society. Yeah. It's by just like going for the evil person. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, no, we're all flawed and yeah. we all make mistakes. Imperfection is perfection. You know, we're human beings. We're, you know, we're, we're meant to not be perfect, you know? And, and I think that that's the beauty of it. Making mistakes allows us to grow. Yeah, you know, like if you're all perfect, then there would be no room for sure. growth or, or or learning or experiencing new things because we'd be we'd be doing everything right. So I think that's that's what we have to understand, and I think that we have to kind of in this age just kind of you know give pe uh, some people the benefit of the doubt. You know that people if they say something wrong, they're not doing it to 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 harm anyone, or if they have, um, you know. The way they're attacking them makes them worse off than the person who sent the tweet in the beginning, if that kind of makes sense. Because and it, or it isolates them, so they're not willing. They're thinking, yeah. I'm not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I yeah. agree with that. I th and I, th I think it is about being c compassionate. But it's not to take away from the fact that if harm is done, that matters as mm -hmm. well. Because I think there's always this thing of saying, we're now being more compassionate to the, you know, the perpetrator than yeah. the victim. And I yeah. think that there's a... An, a, an interesting balance because mm. some people worry if we're so forgiving then we're just giving people a free pass but i think forgiveness isn't just a transaction of you're forgiven for me forgiveness is saying you know you made a mistake yeah own it and your actions will ultimately prove so for me i would say i've not done a homophobic video in 12 years it's well a good done. track record. Yeah, well done, Do I right? get a round of applause for that? Yeah. No, I don't want to. Play. But my, uh, <laughs> you was getting ready for it. Ready. But my point is like, contact context matters. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's about looking at how people have behaved. If people change because they've been caught, yeah. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not sincere. They might actually be trying to change. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that you have to look at the, the bigger picture, not that moment, which is what people do online. People yeah. go. What do they tweet there? Right, that defines them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's just... Well, like, what about Logan Paul? Oh, yeah, I was thinking about him, actually. <laughs> yeah, L Logan Paul's a, an interesting case. Um, and for those... Because that... he's saying that he wants to, you know, change. make a change. And I, I, I believe... Do we give him the benefit of the doubt? Do we... Are we... I, I think it's it wait and... and see the long-term yeah. actions. Um, 
And, and for those of you um, tuning in who, who don't know what Logan Paul did, he mm. famously did a... He, I mean, he has for a long time done sensational videos all about clickbait, him yeah. wrestling bears, which is hardcore. Yeah. Um, and it's just been about getting that next high. Um, but he was in Japan and he was in a forest um, and there was it was renowned to be a suicide forest yeah. where people hung themselves and he found someone who was hung yeah. there and he got to he literally videoed him i mean the thumbnail was of him of the body hanging and then him like looking shocked like it was yeah. edited like that the home alone one yeah. yeah 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 it was like that yeah and uh it was again not excusing it and but absolutely he... abhorrent it, the backlash and some people go oh it's only because he got a backlash that he cares I'm sorry, but when you're that big and you yeah. have all these fans telling you how great you are, yeah. you do require someone to cut for, you know, you need that backlash. Yeah. And he got shaken up and some people go, oh, you're just giving him an easy pass. You know what? Just see how he behaves from now on. And I, yeah. I, I don't really follow him, so he may have made other mistakes. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean he won't get I think, there in think the end. I think he like tasered a rat the week after, okay. which didn't really help. No. Yeah. But pro progress? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Uh, I... Yeah, see, I can't. I find that yeah. bizarre. But the thing I say is, like, people's behaviour doesn't come out of a vacuum. Yeah. Logan Paul wasn't like just some, you know, person that one day thought this will be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. He was someone that was like, "What is the next big thing?" Yeah. And it's just one degree after another, yeah. and eventually you get to an extreme yeah. position. It's like the frog in boiling water yeah, thing yeah. of like, he didn't just go from doing no videos to I'm going to go into a suicide forest and do this. Yeah. And so in that way, I sort of, I don't give him a pass. Yeah. He needs to um, redeem himself through yeah. action. And like he did the whole stuff on mental health following yeah. it. I think it was good. I don't yeah. think that changes it. And I think he still needs to do yeah. a lot more. But but he admits that as well. He, he admits yeah. that he's, he's not there yet. But I think it's quite... Uh, like obviously what happened was obviously horrible you know i mean that video i mean a lot of people can say obviously people reacted different like in different ways is when seeing a, a dead body obviously that's what he was saying that you know he he's not a person who would maybe cry or, or feel shocked and maybe he, he said that when he was laughing he was nervous sure so you know benefit of the doubt and i, but, and I believe all that the issue yeah. is the fact that after yeah. you filmed it, you then go through the process Upload, of yeah. editing it. Yeah, yeah. That, and yeah, then that's doing the, the thumbnail like yeah. that. So I don't have an issue yeah, with how yeah. he reacted and like if but he's then again, like, you know, you know what YouTube is like, and especially vloggers, they are doing constant twenty four seven. They become numb. Uh, and that's what I'm saying and, about and, the high. You yeah. just do the next extreme exactly, thing. Exactly, yeah. So I think for them it was like if they knew what kind of black backlash they were gonna get, they would never have obviously uploaded that video oh, i don't know maybe maybe it was still beneficial at the end because everyone is still talking about him even people who sure. don't even watch youtube sure. like when they say bad publicity is good publicity i'm not saying oh people go out there and do really messed up stuff but at the same time i think it hurt his uh career a lot i think it helped a lot as well sure. and, and at the same time as well i think a lot of good of it, uh good came of it as well because even though that inst uh that incident was horrible but then him then you know, for himself as a human being, you know, being kind of like, you know, putting himself out there and finding out more about mental health, which is like such a, you know, issue in this day and age um, and learning from it and spreading awareness to his millions and millions of fans. Sure. I mean, I guess that's a, that's a positive. In and a lot of young fans, he said, don't defend me because mm -hmm. uh, I know he did that in his apology video. Yeah. And again, I'm not getting into the credence of whether it was a good apology video. That was one detail I thought was good because mm. there were so many young people going, who are just fans and they just like admire them so yeah. much. And again, it goes to the thing of people aren't fully bad or good. They're like, I like him, so you got to defend him. And he's like, yeah. no, don't defend me. And I think that's a lesson for young people yeah. that watched him as well. So yeah, again, I think by having these conversations and if the process of forgiveness is about what do we actually learn from this, it's not just about his journey, it's mm -hmm. about the millions that watch. And people go, oh, so you mean that people have to be taught not to go to a forest? And it's like, but it's about the full context. It's about being responsible that if you have an audience, mm. what is the thing you're communicating? It's also about having empathy. Yeah. Um, so yeah. going back to the story that I don't really want to talk about much more, but the, the racist joke I yeah. told when I was young, in that moment of just seeing this guy's face, it was like an instant moment of empathy of yeah. like, I've caused pain. Why did I say this? Yeah. And um, I didn't do it again. And, you know, um, I, I think it's, empathy is what it's about because yeah. it makes people 
it makes us put ourselves in other people's shoes. You should remember the joke, though. I, 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 do, I, do, I, I, do, I do remember it now, but I'm, I wouldn't repeat it. Why not? <laughs> because it's... Hor- it's uh, what's hor- that me? <laughs> I, I feel, like, <laughs> nauseous thinking about, like, just... Because I just don't, I don't recognise myself yeah. telling that. But you know that uh, that forest yeah. that he went to, that's actually, uh, that's a real forest. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think they made a film. I think I've seen it as well. Oh, maybe. They made a film, film, it's about, like, uh, people in Japan. I think it's Japan. Um, that... Um, that go there and then just commit suicide and apparently it's supposed to be like extremely haunted. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's like it is known for like a place where people go. It's like there's certain bridges in the world, isn't there, that people jump yeah, off? Like, uh, there's, have you heard about that one bridge where dogs would just jump off the bridge? Dogs? Yeah, it's the weirdest phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a bridge and there's a sign literally saying don't take your dogs on this bridge because if you take, if you take your dog to this bridge, he would just jump off. Wow. I didn't make it up. That would be a horrible, you know, disgusting joke. No, that's you, just... You can, you can check it out. My sources are reliable. I'm just... Yeah, I'm just looking at it now. That's what I like. The dog suicide bridge, Milton in Scotland. Yeah, I think it's in Scotland. Yeah, the, the yeah. mystery of Scotland's suicide bridge. That's crazy, isn't it? Wow, it's not... I mean... This... Uh, about half an hour's there, drive right? of the Scottish city of Glasgow, there's a 19th century castle called Overtown House. In the 160 years it's been around, the estate has been served as a movie set, a maternity hospital, and a place of recovery for Allied soldiers during World War II. Yeah, that sounds haunted already. Yeah, 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 yeah it does. Um, in the 1950s, though, people started calling it the Bridge of Death. That's because dogs had started leaping off the bridge to their deaths, apparently without reason. Mm. 50 dogs have died after making the jump in the past 50 years. But you know what I don't get? Like... If the story started spreading that you, you, if you go in on this bridge and your dog would jump off and die, then why would you take your dog like after the, like the eighth incident or something? Because they're well, okay. So I just said fifty people, fifty. fifty whoa, 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 fifty dogs in the last fifty years. During that period, another six hundred dogs have made the leap and survived. So do like do people say? So that's oh, one of my I don't f- believe this. Let's take the dog out and give it a try. Like, is that they're worth that like, risk? My dogs, my dog wouldn't do that. Yeah. Every, yeah, and then and he jumps off, and you're like, oh, I guess I was wrong. Let me cry now, because I've ruined my life. It doesn't make sense. 600, what? So 650 dogs are dead. This is really depressing now. Yeah, I'm not going to answer the rest of this, yeah, but it goes into, like, they, they, there's research to suggest that... You're cheering that, up. That, that, Tell that... us a racist joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be able to drop this. <laughs> What, what kind of what kind of YouTube uh, videos do you watch though? Because I love like you know like haunted stuff or aliens or like conspiracy. Late things. at I love night like before going to bed, yeah. the rabbit hole of just like I'll just have a look at this and yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I because I, I don't watch a lot of like when I was much more involved in the sort of mm. core YouTube community, it was like vloggers would watch each other, and now yeah, not yeah. so much. I mean, now I, I watch a lot of news shows and stuff okay. like, but more like. I guess they are vloggers, people talking about yeah. news. But I watch people from all political persuasions because I just like keeping myself in check and yeah, not yeah. being in echo chambers. But yeah, you, I love watching the sort of the top 10, yeah. you know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. creepiest or haunted places. The top five I watch. Uh, I, I don't know if that guy's from the UK. I don't know if there's a channel called Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. really like his uh, programs. I remember uh, my friend Yogi came to my house and I just wanted to scare the shit out of him. Mm. So just like till five, till five at night. We were just watching this, uh, like all the videos or like top five most haunted or top five, like uh, biggest conspiracy theories right. or whatever it was. And then uh, in the end, I was like, oh, it's, it's late now. You might as well s- you might as well stay over and sleep in the spare room. And he was like, what, you what, mate? And I was <laughs> like, you might as well st- like stay over and s- stay in the uh, spare room. He's like, no, I'm sleeping with you. I'm like, <laughs> but no, you're not. <laughs> five minutes later, I'm like... It's- He's spooning me, brother. I just accepted it and said, you know, it's better than a sex bot, I guess. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a true story. Yo, Gishkalia, check him out. <laughs> King's food. <laughs> Amazing. So on the topic of YouTube, because you, you mentioned right at the start, you went to drama school. Yeah, yeah. What was your intention with going to drama school? Like, what were you doing back then? Because obviously YouTube wouldn't have been really yeah. as big of a thing back then. Um. Yeah, I think that it was just, for me, I just loved kind of entertaining and I loved acting. I loved comedy. And, you know, like, you know, when you're young and you're like, as a little kid, you want to be like a police officer or, sure. or, 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 or kind of like a firefighter or a rocket scientist. Like for me, it was always an actor. 
And yeah. I've always wanted to just get into acting and get into comedy. Sure. And um, yeah, and, and, and as soon as I finished, I, I kind of like, I went to Croydon College and I did two years of performing arts and I got a GNVQ in that. Nice. And then I did uh, two years in Kingston College, performing arts and uh, BTEC National Diploma. Wow. And I wasn't doing it for, so I can say, oh, yeah, I've got a GNVQ. Or, like, I don't think that means anything. Yeah. I mean, no offense if you've got a GNVQ <laughs> and a bit gas. Yeah. But I'm just saying, um, I just kind of did it to, to just put myself into the in, in that environment and just learn and meet new people and, and just kind of like, just for myself, you know, just kind of improve myself I guess and the thing and I think when I went to drama school the thing is like all my life everyone's saying oh you're so funny you're so funny yeah but there's a difference of being funny but then being able to act and and, and be funny while acting right and I think drama school when I went to RDS um, that was uh, that that was that kind of like uh, how shall I say uh, the moment where I realized oh my god I like I, I there's still so much to learn like even though I thought that you know what I've got my craft right but you you will always build and build and you will always learn something new and yeah and that was and my, one of my teachers was Tom Hardy as well Tom Hardy yeah it's a true story yeah, really yeah, yeah because he basically uh, my tutor his name's David Whitworth and he's been there for I think that was his twentieth year um, and um, I wasn't even supposed to go to that drama school basically what happened was I was in uh, Kingston College it was like one of the like the last week uh, before uh, before it ended. And my teacher was like, what are you going to do next? I was like, I don't know. And uh, to be honest, all I could really think about is, well, I think like the new Metal Gear Solid was out. So that's that was the only thing for my future at that yeah. moment of time. And then um, <laughs> he was like, you should really think of, like past, like when you you know complete the game, what are you going to do after? I was like, oh shit, he's got a point. <laughs> and then he was like, oh, why didn't you uh, go to a drama school? It's better than uni because with uni, it's like, if you want to get into acting, I think it's like 90% written work. Right. And I uh, just writing is long. So um, he said, go to a drama school and then, RDS was like a really small uh, drama school. Um, I think it's, it only has like, I think like um, 17 students or something. Right. Um, and he called up David Whitworth, who was in charge of you know the drama school. And he basically said, look, I've got a really talented, uh, uh, a, a young uh, kind of pupil uh, that doesn't know what he wants to do next. I just want you to see him. So David basically said, look, uh, you know, yeah, we've got 17 spaces. It's all filled. Like, you know, can't, can't really do anything now. Um, it's a bit late. So my uh, my tutor then Carlos, um, he basically said, please just give him a chance, and he was like, all right, just tell him to come tomorrow and learn a, a, a Shakespeare piece. So Carlos like, look, you've got like twenty four hours to learn something that's funny and Shakespeare, and you have to kind of perform in front of this guy named David Whitworth, yeah. So I was like, all right, why not, yeah, banter. So I next day I went there, um, I. Did it. What and, did you What did you learn? What Shakespeare? Uh, I think it was something from the Comedy of Errors. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, so I did that, and uh, yeah, David was just really quiet, and then he sat me down, and he goes, "Well, obviously, um, we usually like send you away, and then we'll get in contact with you if you've got the part or not." But I'll be honest with you, throughout my twenty years, we've only had like a certain amount of pupils, and we don't got over. But this is the one year that I'm going to make an exception and we're going to, you know, wow. we're going to allow you to. Basically, I'm saying I'm sick. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and, and I. The and chosen I, one. Yeah. The chosen <laughs> one. And I got in and Tom Hardy used to be taught by David Whitworth. And because this was David's last year, Tom um, decided to come back and, and, and take time out of his busy schedule to. And he was already big then. Like, obviously, now he's like extremely like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now he's like next All relative. Bit. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, he came down and he um, he just started talking uh, uh, um, and teaching us about acting and camera work in Hollywood. And um, yeah, he was he was very intense. We had a couple of issues here and there, um, but um, uh, yeah, he was uh, he was definitely um, uh, really gifted, you know. And I learned so much in that year, uh, not just from Tom, but from David as well. As well. And um, yeah, it was a great experience for me. Uh, and it just kind of uh, after that, I wanted to obviously act, and all my friends were gonna you know go out and you know do auditions and stuff. But I just kept playing the part of you know terrorist number two, you know, and I don't want that, you know, like at least terrorist number one because <laughs> there's more money. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so um, yeah, and then I just I found YouTube. So I used to love like uh, you know making you know like uh, 
uh, small little videos in my bedroom. Not those obviously videos, um, <laughs> and um, and and just kind of like yeah, just edit them up and and just kind of you know have fun with them. So they were just like, oh, why don't you you know put something on YouTube? And uh, I think my first ever thing that I did was uh, it was called the Chronicles of Dotu. It was like some really funny weird stupid thing that I made just five parts it wasn't for anyone I literally just made it and and put it out there just so I know oh I can you know edit a, a production together you know and it's just me messing around with the camera but it's it still fun. up it's still up Is yeah it? yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, and then after that I said all right let me make something now that um that can appeal to other people and that can get you know get someone's attention like whether it's a casting agent or a director or someone who can point me in the right direction let me make something that could hopefully you know spread a bit and and maybe sorry i think i spat bear when i said that That's right. um spread is a hard word <laughs> bit, bit. um and uh and yeah and i kind of i made this thing called diary of a bad man i never put it out but my friends when they would come and they would like try to catch me out see what porn i'm watching yeah mm. never find anything because clear history in that <laughs> uh but then they would come across diary of a bad man and they were like oh why don't you put this out and i was like oh no i, I don't know if that's the one but they were like no just do it you've made it now so i, I put it out there and then everything just changed it was like overnight it was, it was the craziest experience ever like you know, it's like in the first 24 hours, I got like 5,000 views, which back then yeah, yeah, yeah. was, you know, like I was like A-lister now, like Tom Cruise, Will Smith, me, same thing. <laughs> um, and then like it just grew to 20,000. Next day it was like 30,000. The next day it was like 45 and then 60. And, so, and then I was like, I have to make another one. Made another one straight away, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. Made the third one, like started getting to the millions. And, right. and that's kind of like where... And, and it was so funny as well, because as I said, I was just trying to get one person's attention that could help me. But what I didn't realize was YouTube was actually going to create a brand, like, you know, allow me to create my own brand. Sure. And that's why I, 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 I will always say, no matter how much mainstream stuff I do, um, to me, YouTube is probably the most important in my heart anyway. Um, and I have a great relationship with YouTube and, and they've really, I believe, helped me so much through my career. And I, that's why I always like kind of do my part to, you know, whether it's just being an ambassador or, or what, whatever else, I always try to kind of like represent YouTube as best as I can. Because uh, I feel that if it wasn't for them, for a brand, Asian, Pakistani, Muslim, trying to get onto TV when there's only like, what, four or five big channels out there and the stuff that they put out, with the people they choose, cast and choose, I mean, it was just going to be super hard for me to ever achieve my dream. And luckily, YouTube came along and sure. I was allowed to create my own content and kind of like create my, you know, basically make my dream into a reality. You know, just create content and put it out on a channel. And, yeah. And, and getting people to watch it. What's the difference between that and TV? Sure. You know, it's the same thing. So YouTube just allowed me to say, hey, oh, this is your channel. Put it out. Yeah. Um, and not only that, there will be people that watch your videos that have been waiting for content that relates to them or is what they're exactly. after. Whereas yeah. before you'd have to put on five channels. Yeah. I mean, I'll never forget when my nan first had Sky and I'd never known of Sky before. What yeah. is 600 channels? Yeah. And you just go for it. You, you basically spend the time just flicking through the channels. Just absolute rubbish. Like, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it, it's because you could only choose the channels. You couldn't actually choose the content. Now you can actually search for the things that yeah. you want to learn about and so it's now not just being good for content creators like yourself it's also for the audiences to realize what actually matters to me yeah and i can tune in so how how did i always like regard it as a eureka moment sort of that point in your life you look back on and you think and, and sometimes there's more than one moment yeah. where you think that was in hindsight when i became the person that i am today like is there a because you're very much mission driven now with and we'll, obviously we'll get to the, the the tools you've done at schools and that and sort oh. of the 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 messages you've had in your videos but like is there a bit you look back on that you think that was when it sort of clicked for me and it was like that's when i was on this path what clicked as in like where i thought that i was finally living my dream is that what yeah you mean? it could be that well, or or even that you sort of you became awake to like thinking the way that you and of course we're always changing i mean yeah. for me for example yeah was when i was at secondary school and in my final year and you can tell it was a private school when i say this yeah. they had public speaking competitions and in the final year i did a persuasive speech and i took the school rules and i critiqued them because there were people being bullied that were leaving because okay. yeah. they were being bullied the, yeah. the bullier was was fine yeah uh, there was all this stuff going on and in at the time, it wasn't that significant to me. But yeah. in hindsight, I realised that was when I re when I became any establishment. 
okay. like speaking out and it yeah. didn't mean so i yeah. just didn't know if there were times where you thought but it could have been the release yeah. of that video it was like now i'm really reaching yeah. out to people I, I i think you know when i was young i always used to like i would do anything to get a laugh like i remember like with my cousins i'd be like hey look at my bum and i just show my bum <laughs> obviously i realized it's wrong so i started, like, stopped like a few weeks ago uh but i was young and and, and foolish uh but yeah like i would i would just i had so much enjoyment just making people laugh and and i was always like you know i mean it's obviously a bit predictable but i was obviously like you know kind of like the clown whether it's with my family or with my friends or or in class um so i and I always had people around me saying, "You're gonna, you're gonna make it. You're gonna make it." And in my head, I, I didn't think that anything else was gonna happen. Right. Like I just thought that, yes, I'm, I'm gonna be a comedian and an actor, and I'm just gonna have fun with it, and that's the end of. It. Like I never thought, oh, if this doesn't work, then I'll do this. Like I obviously did business studies and sixth form just to gas my Asian parents up and say, oh, I got, a bit, you know, like you know, distinction in business or wherever I got married. I don't know what it was. Um, but that was just to make them happy. But I knew, in essence, thank you. Um, I knew that I was always going to get into kind of uh, kind of comedy. But I think when I released the second video, Dairo Badman 2, I remember um, someone contacted me uh, for a, a music video. And uh, it was just like a small little uh, music video. It was nothing like, you know, to, actually no the production was actually pretty big actually and i remember going there and um there were so many people there and everyone was just so like kind of excited to see me and there was like some asian stars there as well that i knew of um you know asian musicians and, and singers who were also at the video shoot and they were like oh let's take a picture and i'm like oh i should be taking a picture with you why would you want to take a picture with me and then and I remember like you know, and all day, like everyone was treating me super nice. And I felt like, like literally like a celeb. And it was, it was such an, a surreal experience. And I remember going outside, I was so excited. And I, and I said to, to my cousin, I called my cousin up. He's like, uh, his name is Fahim. He's like one, one of my closest people ever. And I said to him, I was like, I can't believe it, man. They, these, these idiots think I'm famous. <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, you know, this, this, everyone's being so nice. I feel like, I probably feel like special. And, um, and I was saying that and, and and I had such a great experience and I I I put the phone down, I, I left. I, I, as I said, everyone was so nice on the video shoot and I just felt so good inside. And then I went into the car and I was like, oh, I guess I'm going back to normal life now. Just, you know, and this is my, only my second video, by the way. I said, yeah. oh, I might as, uh, I'm just going to uh, go. I think was, I was near Edgeware Road. I said, oh, I'm just going to go uh, fill up my car and um, and go home and then just, go back to normal and I went to the petrol station and soon as I got out of the car there was like about four or five boys working past and they were like diary of a bad man please can we take a picture bro can we take a picture bro and I was like yeah of course I just got out of my car I just thought I was going back to a normal life and they took a picture with me all of them and they were so nice and 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 and, and really like um just really polite and 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 kind of like they, they were so excited to see me. It was it was such a surreal experience. And when they left, I rem I will never forget it. In that that one dodgy petrol station, I was just there standing there, and I had this sensation like I just knew that life was going to be different now. Sure, you know. And I just, and 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 I and I but I appreciated it because I was like, God knew that I you know I'm a, I, I try to be as much as I can a very spiritual person. God knew that this was the only I could never do anything else. I'm not, that's probably because I'm rubbish at everything anyway, yeah, mostly. Um, but, you know, that was the one thing that God, I believe, gave me, you know, a, a, a bit of a gift and um, and made me rubbish at everything else, but gave me a little bit of a gift of making people, you know, like laugh or just being an entertainer. And he he gave me that. He gave me that. And I and, and there and then, I, I'll just never, I'll never forget that day because I was like, as soon as I thought I'd go back to my normal life, straight away before, just as i got out of the car i don't know what kind of eyesight they got i think they were like half human half sex bots because they <laughs> they were just they had some next eye life they were so far it was at night i was like what's wrong with you? what kind of carrots do you eat bro uh, <laughs> and they just found me and took a picture and i was just like yeah this is it was the most amazing experience ever and and, and i'll never forget that day that's awesome man yeah. and so for those that aren't familiar with your work, what what is the sort of messaging? Because for you, it's about being 
a British Muslim. And was there a sort of particular point? Was that was that always a theme throughout your videos? But then there was a point where you were like, there is so much anti Muslim rhetoric in the UK, it's now to time to turn it up a notch or to take it head on. I think with Diary of a Bad Man, so it's, I play a, I play a young uh, kind of Pakistani Muslim British citizen living in South London who keeps getting himself into trouble and situations, but he learns from it and, and he grows as, 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 a, as a character. And I knew that this would be great for the Muslim community because they can watch, they can kind of um, relate and, and, and take something from it. And also the Asian community who don't have much to, I mean, when you think of mainstream TV, you think of what? Goodness gracious me. And then like 55,000 years later, we've got Citizen Khan. It's like, <laughs> yes, we're worth the wait, you know? And then, you know, like there's hardly anything out there. So I just, I, I wanted to create something that they could relate to and connect with. And, and, it's, and it's weird as well, because I would, I would be talking about like certain jokes that Asian people do. Like as an example, like we would, when we finish with curry, they would like put it in ice cream boxes. My, that, my mom would always put like curry in ice cream boxes and put it in the fridge or the freezer. So when I see it, I'm like, oh, ice cream. I'm thinking I'm going to have strawberries and cream ice cream. <laughs> Open it and there's like lamb curry, yeah, which completely messes me up. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 but then... But then I would have so many fans messaging me from different backgrounds and, and cultures and right. saying, we do the same. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so when I was doing that, I, I, I kind of did it for just to provide a kind of like a, a form of entertainment for Muslims, Asian people and young people in general. Yeah. Because I was all of these three things and I had so many things that I just wanted to get off my chest. So, so many things that I've learned, you know, growing up. I was like, well, these these things are funny. Let's talk about them. Um, but also comedy is universal. So... I just knew it would appeal to anyone. So I knew eventually, like, after, I think, after, like, Diary of a Bad Man 6, and I've done about 16 episodes, and now I'm, like, on my new series, which is called Bad Man, which is 10 episodes. It's more of a kind of, like, a uh, each one's, like, a feature film, you know, practically. Or like, um, But um, I've, I've taken the character very far, but I knew straight on, after, like, the sixth episode, that this is not just a Muslim thing. This is not just an Asian thing. This is, you know, this is not just for young people. This this communicates to so many more people. And that's the power of comedy. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't, like, my my agenda to kind of make a certain type of content and, and just to keep at that. I was just, I started off doing something that I could relate to and I knew my people would enjoy it, and then it just got broader and I, and I just, I knew my audience was getting bigger and bigger by the day. So I just kind of started, you know, as I said, you know, started broadening the, the world, you know, that I was creating. And, and then I started doing different types of shows. I've got a show called Bubblegum where I play my dad and he's a, he, he runs a shop where he sells school uniform and uh, he has like two illegal immigrants that work for him. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Yeah. And it's really stupid. And it's just like the most random thing you would see. Then I have like uh, Black and Brown, which is me and another comedian called Jazzy. And we have a show about just us two young people just trying to get girls, but always just, you know, failing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, then you have like, you know, Diary of a Bad Man. I, I made Bad Man, which is kind of like more, it's more serious now. It, it's definitely the comedy is still there, but it has, uh, you know, more of a social message. Um, and yeah, as I said, I'm doing all these different types of shows. Um, but in essence, because of the so-called fame that I have since the petrol station incident, <laughs> um, I realized that being a Muslim and being an Asian and being kind of in the limelight or being known as a, as, a, as, a, as a public figure, I have a responsibility to represent to the best of my ability, because I'm not perfect, um, and, and kind of speak out and, 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 and kind of, yeah, basically represent them as, as best as I can. And that's why I always try to kind of go out of my way and, and, and tackle things, whether it's Islamophobia or, you know, like racism or, or whatever it can be. Um, just to kind of help my causes or even just doing more with, you know, uh, char you know Muslim charities. And, and, and I, as I said, I do, I, I do everything, you know, like, but I just, I know where my roots are as well. So I want to, I never want to kind of forget that. It's really interesting because yeah. it goes back to what we're talking about, human beings being complicated, because on the one hand, you are more than a Muslim. Yeah. You're more than Asian. You're a human being that has these traits yeah. in your life yeah 
And so on the one hand, it's like, I want to be an individual. Yeah. But at the same time, the media that we live in will take a stereotype of a Muslim, a yeah. stereotype of an Asian. Yeah, yeah. And the common theme I see when I speak with people from all t backgrounds is it's about controlling your narrative. Mm. So it must be a weird balance because you want to be known more than just a comedian and an Asian Muslim. Yeah, you yeah, want to yeah. be known as lots of different things. Yeah. But in life, when it comes to branding, you do have to choose like what are the, yeah. I hate to say boxes that you tick, but like kind of just think about what are the sort of the labels that I'm going to try and shape and yeah. help improve the perceptions I, I mean, of. I mean, I, th that's, I think that's why it's such a shame. This is why I, I love YouTube and, and, and I don't, as I said, I, I, you know, I'm, I've put my kind of like a foot in to the kind of the mainstream now and I've had like my own BBC show called Coconut, which I think is still on iPlayer. And, um, you know, I just did a Sky short, uh, um, Sky comedy short, um, uh, I think for Christmas uh, with another comedian, Mo Gilligan, who's uh, he's got uh, he's on the Big Nasty Show on Channel 4, which is doing really good as well. Um, and, you know, right now I've got like a... a uh, kind of like a, 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 a not urban, a, like a kind of just just a quiz show, um, a internet quiz show, which is on Together TV as well. So I'm doing like bits and bobs. But what I feel is the majority, and this is just me being real, these big channels, they will say, oh, we need something to appeal to the Asians. Let's get an Asian, you know, let's get, I don't know, like Ramesh. Let's get him, give him a show. That's the Asians ticked off. That's it. If I literally, if I if I see, and and I love Ramesh, I've done stuff with Ramesh as well. Um, but like if I see him, as I said, on, let's just say, uh, uh, on BBC, let's just say he has a show there. I would look at it and say, okay, I know how the execs are thinking or the commissioners. They don't need me because <laughs> they already have one. You know, that that's, 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 but that's, the, that's how it is. It's really interesting, yeah. isn't it? It's, they've, it's, these things have been set up to help have better representation, but what it does is in the long run, it doesn't serve yeah. people because now people, it's we're not just going for diversity in terms of let's yeah. just get people on. It's now like people have become so like, it's tunnel vision. Yeah, yeah, unlike yeah. the what are the boxes you actually do yeah. have to tick. And uh, yeah, that is really. Yeah. I do think it's improving though. Like that's one thing that I'll say. I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to always be that one like pull, pulling out the race card and saying, "Oh, it's so hard for us." It's getting better. Trust me. And and sometimes it can actually play to your strengths being different. You know, because I have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of friends who who are white, and they're like, "You're so lucky because you're you're you stand out. You're different." You know, like we have like, you know, th these are what they they're saying to me. They're saying we go to an audition and like, you know there's like one part and then they'll have like 100 people that all look the same you know that are getting this one part but then you have something where they want a particular now they want like particular like people that look like this 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 and this yeah. and they could never get that part so like you know it always it's give and take as well and, and i know that as a as a kind of like you know as a as a the industry is taking the right steps and they are starting to have a few of the right commissioners with the right mindsets. And I feel that the, you know, the kind of the older wigs are kind of, you know, now not dying off, but like retiring or whatever. And now all these, sometimes you know, dying off. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. old or, you know, maybe and you get electric shock from the sex bot, but you know, whatever it is, you shouldn't be connected in the first place. But what, what it is, it's like, you know, these new commissioners are coming in, there's new blood and it's a new way of thinking. So things are in the right direction. Um, and it can work for you being different, but I think at the same time we are so like I. This is what I have in my heart, and, and my manager Danny, like I, I love him, and 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 we actually no, I take that back. I don't love him. He's just my manager, <laughs> uh, but I have to say it to keep him happy and to get me jobs. But um, <laughs> but I always said to him, I was like, for now, I don't know if my mindset would change, but. I obviously want to get more into the mainstream. And if I can do it, that's great because that's what I want to do. But no matter what, I have YouTube there and I'll just create my own brand. And maybe next year, I don't know, like maybe I'll be like, oh, this is not working out anymore. But in my heart, that's, I just know that's, that's not, a, that used to be a plan B, but that's kind of like a plan A because as a creative, we want to put, we, I don't want to wait two years for a show to be commissioned. You know, I've, I've, I've been in the process where I've like written like such an amazing script and then get turned down after 12 months of work. Right. You know, what was the point of that? You know, no money can justify that 
year being wasted of your life you know there's not as much to gain uh in that you know and and uh yeah that's why i always look at youtube like a great place like look you had a podcast idea you wanted to do this sure. you didn't rely on anyone else you did it yourself you know vice versa like my show bad man like the last the last episode that i did was like nearly an hour and a half long and it all came out of my pocket but why because i'm creating content that I feel that people are really going to enjoy and are missing out on. And it, I'm it, I'm not relying on, you know, someone to give me a call and saying, we're going to fund your show. I'll do it myself. I'll, I'll make it myself. When I die, I know that content is going to be enjoyed by millions and millions of people, you know, even after I'm gone, you know, and that's that means more than anything else. It is the flip side of building your own audience and then letting the media follow. I mean, I mm. think of... Um, even in terms of news about there have been, I think it's changing a lot now, but I, I, I used to think about Occupy Wall Street, which um, God, it was quite a few years ago now, but in New York. And I remember that watching all this alternative media doing live streams on the ground of mm. crowds, unlike protests, like, unlike I've ever seen in New York, and yeah. the media wasn't reporting on it. Yeah. But it got to a point where the media would then look, the, the mainstream media would look out of touch mm. of, oh, we're not reporting on it. And you see yeah. a lot of these things now where a video goes viral online yeah. and then the news has to report on it. And, and unfortunately, it's gone the other way now where did they really have to report on that? But mm -hmm. they feel they have to or else they seem out of touch. Yeah. But it but it's this sort of flip side and it goes back to like controlling your own narrative that yeah. you can still go for those jobs in broadcast and that. Yeah. But if you keep massaging your channel with your core content where your integrity is 100%. Mm. You haven't had to have it, you know, watered down by, you know, the commission of yeah. lots of people um, tuning in. Um, it means that if, if, if that's you controlling, you know, your brand, it means the opportunities you get, yeah. they'll refer to that. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. people that have had to go into broadcast straight away, yeah. that shapes their brand. Yeah, yeah. Which sometimes works for the better, mm -hmm. but at least through this way, you know that I've had the freedom yeah. to work out exactly what I want to do. Yeah, 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 and no, I agree. So you, I'm going to jump to something and then you can fill in leading up to this. The police got involved. Let's see, starting a sentence like that <laughs> is not good. From your videos, the police got involved, yeah. which in most cases is not uh, a sentence you want to have describe you with. <laughs> yeah. But you work with the police. Yeah, and I did, you started yeah. going into schools as a part of their program. Yeah, I did, yeah. It's and so crazy. how did that start and... What was the aim and what was your input in that? I think, uh, yeah, my um, my uh, manager just called me up once. I love that. Yeah. The police are called. And yeah, <laughs> literally, he said, the police have called. And I was like, oh, shit. And I'm just thinking, what did I do in the last week that they've clocked? <laughs> and... Uh, and then you he's like, your history. Uh, it was yeah, deleted. Yeah. I know. I was like, I've done, I've done all the basics, and um, and then yeah, and then I thought, okay, let me let let's uh, meet them up because they offered lunch. So I was like, you know what, they played it right. So uh, yeah, we went. We had a curry. It was nice, and uh, and then yeah, they were just like, uh, we're trying to uh, stop young kids from being radicalized and from doing something that you know would kind of jeopardize their own life as well as others now obviously for me like I, you know obviously i've been i've grown up in streatham and norbury and thornton heath and 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 you know those kind of areas where like working with the police is a bit kind of like it would you know sometimes you would say that it, it could you know ruin your rep but then i was like i don't even have rep anyway <laughs> so why not yeah and uh and yeah, and, 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 and to be fair, like, when they spoke to me, they said, you, look, we, we want you to make a video. And I made a video called I'm a Muslim, not a terrorist. And you're basically just stopping young people from, as I said, hurting themselves or others, uh, you know, who believe that they're doing it in the name of God. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people from Britain who have fled yeah to, to join the fight yeah yeah well, well you say a lot i i, I but I, yeah more than there should be it's not as yeah, one should yeah, is yeah, more yeah, than yeah, it yeah. Should but be, you're but right yeah, yeah. in terms of how the media perpetuates it it's 100%. not like yeah, there yeah. aren't like plane loads <laughs> exactly that, that's the thing like you know like it's it's talked about so much but yes. honestly like we're talking about a handful of cases if if that yeah but you have to understand that even if one person does something bad it's it can 
it, it can affect so many people yeah you know so that's that's the point it was just like even with my work i've always said that you know i use comedy as a tool to to help people when they feel down when they feel out because i always say in my talks like um you know life is so hard and you know we go through so much stuff whether it's like you know family issues or peer pressures or or losing a loved one or heartbreak or whatever it is and and it's just great when I make a joke when I'm on stage, like when I'm doing stand up or even through one of my videos, if, if someone's watching and, and they laugh at one of my jokes for those 10 seconds while they're laughing, they forget everything. And I think that's the most beautiful thing you can mm. do for another human being. And, and, I, and I've always kind of wanted to you know, create content to just make people because I've we've all felt it. we've all had that kind of, you know, being in, in, in a dark place. And, and sometimes I mean, I've had like literally tens of tens of thousands of messages all saying that, you know, Oh, this helped me in me in my stage of depression, or this helped. You know, I I, I don't even want to talk about it. it. Actually, makes me teary. Like the, the amount of messages I would get of fans that are going through the craziest things, um, but saying that my videos help. I'm like, really? I'm like, well, if that's the case, I need to keep making videos. But anyway, so but with the police, it was just about. It was it's two sides because not only am I as a British citizen, you know using my kind of fame you know for uh, for good uh, and giving back to the community but then also i have a an opportunity where um, i can also show non-muslims that don't believe what you see on the media like all of this stuff like muslims we're not we're not like you know like when you say when you um, a lot of people who might not have that education or knowledge about what a muslim is or what islam is you know from just the, the TV and, and the newspapers, you would have this kind of image of a Muslim just being like, you know, terrorist looking dangerous threat. Sure. But as I said, like, look how long you've known me. I haven't blown anything up yet. Not in, not what I mean? Not, not in yet. front of me. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> and that's the thing. It's like, um, I, I get an opportunity to kind of spread that and just say, look, we're normal people just like you. Mm -hmm. We eat, we breathe, we sleep just like you. Might, might be a bit more hairier, but with the same really, um, and uh, and yeah, and, and then I made that video and it did really well, and then they were like, let's go to a school and, and go to a classroom and surprise the kids. So we went to Leicester. We had like loads of like people coming down, like BBC and and, and I think like I don't know LBC or Capital. Oh, all of them. They all came down and 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 they um, and and they were there and, and the kids loved it and they were like, oh, let's do a few more schools. So we did a few more schools. Um, and we started doing a couple of assemblies and it just spread like wildfire. And I think in this space of a year and a half, I think I did over 130 shows wow. and I performed to over 80,000 young kids. Wow. Doing that one classroom with like 20 kids, we were doing like assemblies, six, seven, 800 kids at a time. And I would be doing four shows a day. But And all over the UK. Yeah, all over. I know oh, it was actually all over London. Oh, was it? Yeah, I, th I think, I think we did. A, 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 no, we did a bit out outside of London, sure. but majority was was actually in London. So, and honestly, it was one of the hardest experiences of my life because I had to wake up like five ish. <laughs> I was like, this is not right. This should be like forbidden. <laughs> but at the same time, it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done because not only I got to see my fans because most of them, you know, I don't know how, but they watch my stuff they know who i am they were excited to see me and the energy was crazy but then knowing at the end you know just you know i'd make them laugh and and and, and i would like kind of you know entertain them but in the end just spread a uh, just a a message first of all that you know us muslims we are normal people just like you um and also you know just to the muslims there as well just to make them realize that remember that even if you feel like sometimes you're being picked on and you feel like you have to retaliate, not with violence, because in Islam we don't we believe that the that violence and anger comes from the devil, you know. So, you know, that's not who we are as people. If you look at, you know, what we actually believe in, Islam means peace, you know, but people obviously don't don't see that because the only time you have you see the heading Islam, it's usually, you know, attached to terrorist or, you know, explosion or, or death. Or you know stuff like very negative things, mm -hmm. so yeah, that was a very crazy experience, um, but it was amazing, and and it, and it changed my life as well. I mean, I started like, I met The Rock, 
And he told me that he read my article because it was next to him in the New York Times. Really? Yeah. And this is, we had the same agents. Basically, uh, quite long story short, my agents, W and me, we were in Hollywood, Beverly Hills, I think, long table, all these agents. I was like, I didn't even know I had these many agents. They were like, oh, who would you love to work with? I was like, uh, well, um, obviously my role model is a rock. So one day, obviously not now, I'm not guessing it. And then, um, and they were like, oh, are you a fan of a rock? And I was like, obviously everyone is, who, who wouldn't be? <laughs> And they're like, oh yeah, well, he was going to come in today. What I'll do is let me, let me just give him a call. And if he's coming in today, I'm going to tell him to come early. So you can just, you know, like catch up with him. And literally there, I can't even repeat what I said to her. You know, I just basically didn't believe it. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. just thought that she was just the devil. <laughs> uh, and then uh, 30 minutes later. Dwayne uh, Johnson. Dwayne like... Johnson. And it's like, we went into a room. So it was Dwayne, uh, his agent, uh, my agent. And my manager, I don't know, she wasn't there really, to be fair. And we're just in a room. Uh, Rock shook my hand, obviously broke it at the same time, but sure. I appreciated the gesture. And um, it was crazy when he said, this is my role model, yeah? Or someone that I look up to, like he's my hero. Like I, I, I love Dwayne in acting, wrestling, everything. And um, he just said, yeah. I read one of your articles about, you know, something about your tours or something. It was next to mine because he's, uh, uh, new film Son Andreas was was coming out, oh, right, yeah. and um, I, I swear to you, I was like, I, I just I was like, wow, I'm just a fat Pakistani from South London, and and the Rock is bigging me up, like you know, like always read about me, and his agent just come out nowhere and goes, yeah, he he has a nineteen and I think ninety million views, and he was gassing. It was actually eighty two at the time, but I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I got ninety, <laughs> and uh, and then and honestly, then Dwayne just just chilled with me and he just spoke to me um he made a video we took pictures and and he he was the it was the best experience of my life and then uh after that we um we went and i was so upset as well because he was like let's uh you you know obviously you do youtube videos let's let's record something now where's your camera and that was the only day i left my camera in the hotel or my villa or whatever it was and i was so upset yeah i literally i could have slapped myself yeah. and um but anyway and then we went to new york afterwards because we had meetings there and then from new york when we were coming back to london my phone was popping off and um literally uh, i think i uh, my I, I picked up eventually and it was one of my friends jp uh, i wouldn't call him a friend i just know him and um and uh, he was like oh the rock just shouted you on his instagram and i was like bro shut up like once again you know too many devils out there like you know, don't, <laughs> don't that, that's gonna upset me if i find out it's not true that's not even funny yeah yeah like um and then I checked and he put up uh, the Instagram picture of me and him. And he just said that oh, I would love to one day work with you. And he did. And he reposted my one because um, I did like a long essay about meeting my hero. And that I think was like, I don't know what the time was roughly, but whatever time it was in New York, in London, coincidentally, this could have been a crazy coincidence. But it was my birthday at, and it was exactly 12 o'clock when he put it up. Like, so it was just after midnight. That's cool. So it was like. And he says, I'd like to work with you one day. Yeah, something like so that. So have, yeah. have you screen, or you get, take it and then that's a contract. Yeah, isn't it? That's, 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 that's pretty, I'm just waiting to, to be in anything with him. But yeah, yeah but anyway, like, I need to go up to America a bit more anyway. So that's hopefully it will happen. If if not, I'm I'm happy. You know, I just got like two bottles of free water. So I'm, that's, I'm living life right now. <laughs> I mean, cheers. That's amazing. And it's good to show that you know what, you can do things that have a lot of societal benefit and like make a difference and you can have fun on the side. There's like yeah. this idea that you've got to choose one or the other and it's nah. like, no, you, we live in this world now where people from all different industries and that, you, you, you can do a bit of everything yeah. and I, I think that that makes life exciting as well. You, you were saying about um, when you were speaking to these kids about it's a, it's about combating, again, the narrative yeah. of, of how Muslims are perceived in the media and that. Something that often comes up a lot, I, I personally think there is some truth to it. I think to the extent that responsibility is put to this side, mm. I think is overblown. But it's the idea that moderate Muslims need to be more outspoken in the media yeah. to combat and sort of take responsibility. Yeah. And we can straight away go, yeah. so every time there's a shooting, do all white, yeah. you know, or, yeah, or white yeah, guys yeah, shoot, yeah. do all white people. But I think there is some truth in the sense of, you know, let's not just say it's about Islam. Uh, 
I think ideology is potentially dangerous mm. if it's fundamental in the sense yeah. of you don't use critical thinking. Yeah. Um, people always talk about, you know, cherry picking as if it's a bad thing. I think if you take the good elements yeah. and you optimize it yeah. to improve your life, I think that's good. But I, 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 I don't single out religion yeah, as yeah. The, it's any ideology. Yeah, yeah. I think if you're... Um, if your ideology is capitalism yeah. entirely yeah. and like you stand by it no matter what, that's dangerous. Yeah. If it's socialism, again, I think, and I think with all ideologies, I think there's an issue there. So, so I think there is some truth about getting the voice about being a moderate because I think being a moderate is just being critical. Yeah. And, and and so when you spoke to the schools, did you also talk on the other side about because because obviously you're trying to plant seeds to make it so that young people don't even consider of going down the yeah. dark path of, because radicalization is yeah. from fundamentalism. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. And yeah. So, so how did that, how was that involved in, did, did yeah. you do topics on that? Yeah, so I mean, basically like the format was when, when I went uh, to all the schools, so I'd come in, I'd surprise them. Uh, most of the time they wouldn't know that I'm, I'm there. So the first five, 10 minutes would be pretty crazy. So it's just morning yeah. assembly. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Then you... just like, hey, and then like, uh, like I've got a couple of vlogs, uh, I think two vlogs of the schools that I, um, that I did. I I've seen some of the footage the of them going already. crazy. Oh my yeah, God. it's amazing. I've, I've had the craziest stories. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so the, it would be a great reception. Um, and uh, and then yeah, and then afterwards, we just I would just kind of like uh, uh, make a few jokes, um, tell them why I'm here, um, and yeah, and then. Um, I, I don't want to be preachy because young people today are the I, I even say like I guarantee you most of you are more intelligent than me because like the way that the society like these kids like I've seen two year olds like like do things on the iPad that I didn't even know about like certain like I had my little I think my little cousin he's like literally like he's not even two yet and he did like a shortcut on getting on the app and I was like raw how do you do that and he don't even speak <laughs> I, I he didn't even answer me. Like, I, I remember my last year of secondary school leaving yeah. the IT lab, and the first years were literally learning in information technology what I just learned. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, but that's again because technology is moving so fast. Yeah. But it's, it was depressing, but also the sense of okay, but well, it's like so it's nothing to do with when you're old enough to learn yeah, it. It's yeah, just yeah. that it's crazy. I, <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, that, I mean, as I said, it's it's, it's AI in it, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so when 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 I um, when I do I do want to I don't want to be preachy. I don't want to I don't want to tell the kids what's right and wrong. They already know that. Yeah, they they are um, uh, clever enough to you know differentiate the the difference between right and wrong. All I'm saying is I just my message is that I want to do is to to show like people who don't know much about Islam who are not Muslims that look you know we're normal people just like you and and tell them a bit about myself and 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 what I'm doing. Uh, and then just for the Muslims as well, just to say, look, as well, like you have to understand that, you know, I believe, you know, like m most of these kind of terrorist attacks, I mean, this is led from not religion. Yeah, this is, you don't you don't read the Quran and it says, oh, yeah, kill these many people or do this or do that. No, like nothing is like that there. Yeah. But these people, they're using religion because they're you know, Mus Muslims are so passionate. We have, you know, like like so many like religious people, whether you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, or or you know, whatever you are, whatever you believe in, you know, a lot of people who are very religious have that passion for God. So if you're saying, oh, you have to do this in for the for God, yeah, and you are someone who portrays themselves as to be very religious and pious, then if you're very young and, and vulnerable to being influenced. You're going to be thinking, well, that guy who's got a really long beard looks like he knows what he's talking about. And yeah, we are kind of like, we need to retaliate because of all the bad things that are happening to us. And that kind of justifies their actions. Like, sure. you know, and and what I'm trying to say is that we're in a day and age where we don't need to, we don't need to make a statement by, by hurting people, sure. you know, by doing you know, doing something that's actually not in our religion is not part of our character, and 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 just not. You know, there's there's other ways. There's other ways of making a social impact. The different, like, look at me and you. There's loads of things that we want to achieve. Yeah, you know, this podcast is you're gonna meet some amazing people and create some great conversations. And someone after today, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and someone someone is gonna 
you know appreciate and that could stem to something else and 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 you know create a movement of a topic that you might have been talking right. about whatever it is or yeah. change someone's perception of oh yeah maybe i've said a few racist jokes or oh yeah like you know i used to say a couple of things that were a bit you know homophobic or sexist or whatever it is like they can learn from it mm -hmm. you know or, or maybe i should not have sex with my robot anymore because it's dangerous you know like whatever the it debate is, is still out there yeah, everyone. The debate, obviously <laughs> we'll, we'll, yeah that's that's a, that's that's another podcast maybe for next year um but um but you know the, the fact is it's like even with me like i showed them i said look what i'm doing i'm using my platform to spread awareness to spread peace and a good message and i know that i'm probably gonna help more people and do more good than anyone thinks they're doing if they're doing a terrible act you right. know yeah um but i but when i say these uh, these kind of messages they would be very short mm -hmm. but impactful yeah. And then in the end, then afterwards we do like a Q and A, and it'd be like a stand up, like an improv stand up yeah. comedy, and we'll just all have a laugh, and then we'll do like a huge selfie, and then I'll just put it out, and that's it. And then and they, you know, because I don't want them to feel that that's the only reason I'm there, but just to just to plant that little seed, you know, that food of thought, that you know, just be careful, you know, we we're a community, it doesn't matter what religion you are, you know, we are growing up, and you guys are the future. We need to kind of conduct ourselves where we all kind of. Um, you know, we don't want segregated groups, you know, we mm -hmm. don't work like that now. Like we are all mixed when you look, you know, even just around us, you know, like, you know, we are different people from different backgrounds, but we have the same kind of feelings, the same ambitions, the same yeah. as. So I think that's really important to put across to the to the young kids and stuff. And and don't get it twisted. It was it was um, it was scary as well, because you know, I don't want like, you know. Like with the newspapers, because I was on literally everything. Like everyone was like talking about the story, but they were like and they had international. Um, oh yeah, yeah. It was it was as I said, yeah. New York Times, Washington ABC, Post, CBS, yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, literally everything. Um, but then they were like doing headlines, like like Britain's best tool to fight like ISIS and stuff like. I'm like, whoa! <laughs> like, I do YouTube videos. Do you know what I mean? Like don't like don't take it there. And, and also as well, like another thing I wanted people to know is I'm not a puppet. Like I told the police, I'm going to say whatever I want. You have no, and, and to be fair, I'll be honest with you. They were, they were blessed. They, they, they said, look, Hamza, it's better you going into like, let's just say a school that's majority, like let's just say 80% are Muslim. It's better for you to go and, and say whatever you want and feel knowing what are just, yeah. all we want to do is just keep our community safe. If you can portray that in your message, you can say whatever you want, yeah? Um, uh, but I'm not going to be, be called a puppet. I don't want to be a propaganda tool. I don't want people to think that I'm reading off a script, sure. yeah? And they understand that, what well, I was saying, that I'm going to have more impact with the kids, not just because of the connection that we're Muslim, but also because they watch my videos and they, they know what I'm about. And, you know, some might see me as a role model. I don't know why, but I'm obviously, you know... I, I respect that responsibility and I try my best to, you know, to, to do good like like those tours and, and 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 they will have more connection with what I'm saying and it'll be more impactful than if, you know, with all due respect, uh, you know, uh, uh, a 50, 60 year old, you know, or middle aged white police officer, you know, that's coming in and speaking to, you know, uh, 500 kids that are majority Muslim that, you know, talking about radicalization and and all of that stuff it's it's not gonna it's gonna go in in one right. eye, in one other. and it's it's not that and being a police officer sure. as well yeah it's not as if what they're yeah. saying is not valid it's yeah. just that you need a diversity of voices as mm. well and and that's that's the thing i think it comes down to with diversity is it just means that you know everyone learns things in a different way if we yeah. take it to that simple point um unfortunately you know traditionally the education system is like a one size fits all with like yeah. one textbook everyone in the room has to learn it and yeah. regurgitate it in a two hour exam. Yeah. Whereas actually different people take messaging in different ways. Yeah. And so having different types of voices yeah. who come in, because there'll be people that you in that room that may have not, or you might've just got the ball rolling in their mind and then they would have gone on something else, which has then got them on the right path. Yeah. But you're right. It's about not being preachy because people have to basically come to their own conclusions. Mm. Or if, 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 you just preach to them and they just copy and paste what you say into their heads. That's not learning critical thought. Yeah, and that yeah. sort of goes back to like what fundamentalism can be, which is just like, 
you just accept what you're told. Yeah. And I think that's the problem with the media is for generations now. It was watch the six o'clock news. Okay, I'm now informed. Yeah. And I mean, that's not the world we live in now. <laughs> I, I mean, I think the media played it so wrong. Like, I'm not saying whatever. I don't want to get too deep in what their agendas are. But they have to realize that if you keep attacking a certain group of people and you keep poking at them or poking at them, eventually, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to you're gonna poke yeah, yeah. back. And yeah, then yeah. you can't. Like, you can't then complain. You have to help the problem, not yeah. add f uh, fuel to the fire. Yes. You know, and I, I think that's the problem. Like, I spoke to so many people, like young people who are Muslim at these school events. And they, I mean, the stories that they were telling me, I mean, like some people, like, they don't even want to wear, a, 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 have a beard because they don't want to get stopped by the police. That, And I'm not saying all police are bad, but I'm just saying that, you know, a lot of them have experiences that yes. because they look like a Muslim now, they are going to be kind of stereotyped to be a certain way sure. and they're going to get stopped more and they're going to be searched more and, and they're going to be picked on more. And, 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 you know, it's, you know, like I know girls who, you know, they're ashamed to wear a scarf and I'm right. like, that's, you know, a head scarf. I said, that's such a shame. Like, you know, we're in a country where anyone can wear whatever they want, you yeah. know, they can express themselves however they want, whether it's like tattoos or whether it's like, you know, dressing up and, you know, looking nice and in a, you know, a bikini or so, whatever, whatever you want to yeah. wear, you can wear whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, but to, you know, to dress modestly, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, covering up, you feel that it's wrong because then people are going to connect you to a certain type of people yeah. and and that's wrong like you want people as i said this is what stems from from the from the start of the podcast it's about f trying to fit in and i think that unfortunately muslim people and the media has a lot to play with it don't feel like they fit in and i'm and, and i'm f drumming it into the media that look guys you know like i mean now i don't think it's like this was an issue like four or five years ago that was it was really bad now everything's quiet down obviously there's still things that happen here and there which are just terrible but you know i think that from like even because we we were we were fighting against jihadi brides so what was happening was uh these young girls was would... this the three girls that um yeah because I, I know it's happened on a yeah. few occasions but it was three i can't remember You're from east london it was east london wasn't it mm. and and uh and basically um they just got up and left. They just got up and left. And what was happening was these... And to Syria. Was yeah. It? yeah. So these disgusting men, they would prey on young vulnerable girls through social media. And they would kind of manipulate them and brainwash them into thinking that, you know, for, for the in the name of God, you know, they should come to, to, to help fight the war, you know, against the... The non-believers yeah. or whatever they're America or whoever they're, Build the they're fighting at the, yeah and um these young girls literally left everything their homes their families how their old loved were they? ones um i don't know exactly how old but they were in i think it was it year 10 oh so they so they were teenagers uh, yeah yeah um but still way too young oh. to to make those kind of decisions God, yeah. and um they yeah they left everything they I think I think there's a way where they go to Turkey and then from Turkey they can go to Syria. Of course, right. And um, and yeah, and, and and these girls, what they do is when they get there, they'll realize straight away that what they were promised and what they envisioned is not the reality of the situation, and they'll probably end up marrying some, you know, really old guy that they've never met before that's like three, four times older than them, and they will become, you know, for a lot of these cases, sex slaves, you know. And um, uh, yeah, uh, that was a, a big problem. And uh, you know, I knew I didn't know directly, but I knew one of the girls, like one of her brothers. And uh, and yeah, it was it was it was kind of a moment where that's kind of when that happened all at the same time. That's what made me because remember that was me taking time out of everything to do those school tours. Sure. That took so much of my time. But I had to put everything on hold and I said, I have a responsibility, especially when that happened. I was like, you know, imagine how many people are affected now, how the mum must be. Imagine having a daughter and then one day you never see her again and you know that she's in a, in a, in a foreign place halfway across the world being a sex slave. So I, I, probably I, I, dying. The, yeah. the free, we don't know what's happening. I, so I, think, I think that there's confirmation I, I I don't know because sure, yeah, I've sure. kind of, yeah I kind of like it's it's so weird but look they're not I mean I hope 
they will uh, they're not coming back and i think some recently and I, i've only heard whispers from it so i haven't done my own research uh yet but i think one of them is already dead i think right. i'm not sure if it's if it's not but anyway well uh the the fa- fact of the matter is you know these jihadi buys when they'll go off they're not coming back yeah you can't just say oh this didn't really work out let me just go back and you know and work and work in primark like it's not that's it that's no, no. the you don't that's Cause it, that's cause, it because the border won't even let yeah it, or, once you've made that decision that's it and you know when when that happened i knew that i had a responsibility and i knew that you know uh, while i have this kind of social power i need to react and do as much as i can to make a difference because you know um you know I, as i said i have a responsibility you know i feel like you know um whether you choose to live up to the responsibility when you're in that kind of position is up to you as an individual but for me i knew i had to do what i had to do because not many people who are muslim and in the industry were kind of talking about these things and it's not their fault as well like who wants to talk about terrorism and radicalization and jihadi brides it scares the shit out of me i'm not a politician i'm not you know i'm i'm a comedian i make jokes this is not my but and it goes back to what we were saying before of on the one hand you are more than a muslim so yeah. you don't want to go forward and say this is what a Muslim really yeah, is. Yeah. But on the same time, if you don't do that, you create a vacuum where the media then says, well, this is the imagery we have. Yep, yep. These are the stories that we have that we can paint yeah. it. And so it's kind of, uh, you have to yeah. and, and claim the label. And that's why I did it. And, you know, and I have to give, even though I, I slammed the media a bit for, you know, adding fuel to the fire. But one thing I'd say is they were very supportive of my work. They were like, oh, yeah, finally. And, and you know, they you know i i really appreciated the fact that they were writing good things you know not just because of me but because of what it would do you know yeah. like and and what message we're kind of you know trying to portray and 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 uh, put out there but the fact is i worked my ass off for a year and a half it was the hardest thing i've ever done in my life yeah i like you know four shows a day i remember i did four shows in a row an hour each right I didn't have a break. The only break I had is when 500 kids would leave. Right. You. The other 500 kids yeah. would come in. In those two minutes, I would have a sip of water. Yeah. And, I, and I did that full in a row. Yeah. Then I had lunch and I had two more shows. Right. And that's when I was like, I'm, I'm actually killing myself. But about a year Especially ago, if you want to, it's come across organic and free flowing yeah. and you are doing the same structure. Yeah, that, yeah. I, I you know. honestly, there was points where I literally thought I'd collapse. Right. Like I was going, uh, maybe it was because it was a bit more personal. I was really trying to, but I just knew the kind of, I just felt those weight on my shoulders. I was like, I have to do it. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> um, And I wanted to as well. Um, But then about a year ago, I was invited to Scotland Yard and um, they, they presented me with an award. Well, it was not well, not award. It was just a cheap piece of paper, but I took it because it was free anyway. Um, um, and then, uh, it was, well, it wasn't like, it wasn't a just a piece of paper. Um, but it's framed now. You framed yeah? it. I don't know where it is. Uh, but the the point of the matter is, I really appreciated it, obviously. Yeah. Um, and um, no, but one thing that I remember, um, one of my friends who who works with the police, he basically said that the number of young girls. That are going off to Syria and in becoming now jihadi brides now is practically zero. Now I'm not saying of course. that that's because of me. Yeah, and yeah. I told you no. after the petrol station incident, I would change the world. It was nothing like that. But one thing I know, even if I had one percent yep. to do with that statistic, just one percent, knowing that I probably changed definitely. Now I definitely changed one life. Yeah. You know, I saved maybe one life. Those 130 shows, those, the, those, you know, countless times where I thought I was going to die on stage. If I've saved one person, yeah. no matter how much fame or money or power you get, there's no bigger satisfaction of knowing that I've done something good. You were and part something of the solution. And I was, I was part of the solution, exactly. So that was what, what was kind of great about the, the whole... Uh, the whole situation and so, as i said now as much as i can if i can represent my community not just as a muslim not just an asian but as a british citizen i'll always like do my part you know and that's not me being cheesy like yogi is one of my closest mates he knows that you know i i'm 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 doing this because i know that you know i've been blessed with this platform and 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 you know being kind of in the limelight and while i'm in the limelight um 
it's best to entertain and make people laugh. But if I can do a bit of good as well, that's amazing. Absolutely, man. Yeah, man. And you know, I've said it before, but like, it's really appreciative what you do, and like, congrats with those successes. And it's good that you've been able to continue making content, like following that. Because sometimes yeah. you might think, if you go and do that for a year, yeah, you say you take a break. Is that now? Because it's not to say that you wouldn't mind doing that still, but sometimes when you go down a route in life, you're always worried: is there actually? Am I going to be able to pick up from where yeah. I was? So, so when you do videos now, what? What has changed with your videos pre doing that tour and afterwards? Is there anything? Because obviously, I know you want to say, no, I've kept my integrity. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Nothing's changed. It yeah. hasn't changed for me. Yeah. But there must have been some things that fundamentally that you may, even if it's not yeah. what the product is, but just the way that you approach it. You know, to be honest, I think the one thing that's changed, like I was always passionate about helping others. But when I literally went out of my way and did something that I knew that I was literally. 100 percent being selfless and not sorry not thinking not being selfish and, and 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 thinking this is about me but actually going out of your way fully to make a difference and make a change and then seeing the positive outcome from it that made me now with my work always think that whatever i do and obviously i'm a comedian but obviously i love to create like right now we're um for uh, for the creators for change um we're, right now we're working on um, our project is um uh about a toxic masculinity right yeah and and last year when i did it um because <clears throat> when the ambassadorship happened i was like one of the the, the first so uh, and, and on that time i had to do four videos so i did one about bullying right one yeah. about uh, mental health one about islamophobia and one about uh knife crime because basically my cousin got stabbed like four times and both of his lungs got punctured and he knew yeah it was like a gang in the it was actually in Eltham you know where Stephen Lawrence oh yeah, it was literally like two minutes from there um it was one of the craziest experiences ever and I just kind of retelled the story um but uh yeah that's another story but oh, I am gonna get back to that yeah, yeah. Time, yeah. When, when we when we did those kind of videos like I'll just I'll use the bullying one as that was my like my my first video that came out uh, for the creators for change um when i did that and obviously after i did all the tours i realized the impact that it was making and when i put that bullying video out i remember i remember going through my comments now i don't i don't like going through, i don't know about you but i don't like going through my comments very much unless i know that okay because you know you'll get like a hundred really nice ones, and, and then the you'll one get sticks one out. will be like, "Oh, you, you're looking really fat, or <laughs> oh, you you got dry skin on on your top high, right eyebrows," and I'll be like, oh, sure. "You know, like he's right, damn, I'm a bad person." Like it can get to you, but I remember going through that till five in the morning because it was like thousands of comments, and I swear to you, every and I'm not I'm not really an emotional person. I, I would say, uh, no, I think I'm, emotion I'm emotionally intelligent, but I think I, you know, I feel that I, I kind of, I kind of control my emotions sure. very well and bottle it, and not bottle it inside, but like keep it, you know, uh, controlled. But I was so, I was getting really emotional because I, re I realized how many people this is helping. So I think that the more things that I do of this, the more benefits I see and the more hungry I become to, you know, to do more videos that can help anyone in the situation. Like literally, I, I've got so like I'll tell you this one quick story as an example. And this is not even about the tours, it's just my work in general. Because sure. in the diary of a bad man, I always had a message at the end. Um I remember I was in Birmingham, um, lovely place. Um, and um I was um we were in a I think range and I had security. And they were like, let's get ice cream. And they leave me. So I'm thinking I need to like sack these guys because they're, they, they, they've left me for ice cream in Birmingham. Yeah. So they say, I was, I was fine. I, I, you know, I grew up in Streatham. What's the worst can happen? Next minute I know I see this guy and he, he looked scary. Yeah. And I don't even get intimidated much. Yeah. But he looked like he was trouble. Like you could just sense, you could just tell. Just so, uh, just he had this aura, and he came up to me, and I was like, "Well, you know, this is the end, I guess." Uh, my daughter just smile, <laughs> you know, um, and he goes, "Yeah, you, you're Diary of a Bad Man, isn't it?" And I'm like, "Well, that's not what my mom named me. My name's Hamza, but yeah, you can call me Diary of a Bad. You can call me whatever you want." Um, uh, but yeah, no, I just said, "Yeah, it's me." 
And uh, he was like, yeah, like, I, I, I watch your videos, bro. And I have to say something. Like, it changed my life. Now I'm thinking, like, oh, I think he just wants a selfie. And he's just, you know, guessing the thing. So I'd feel really good and, and, and com comply with his selfie. Um, uh, yeah, I, that's what I thought. So we, t we took a selfie. And then he goes, yeah, you know, you, you, your videos changed my life. And I was like, really? I was like, how? How did it change your life? And... I'll just do the short version. He used to be in a gang. He did some terrible things. He got kicked out. I think he lives with his uh, just with his mum, and she's like single mum. Uh, she basically disowned him because he was literally going off the rails. And I made this video where uh, in Diary of a Bad Man, I think it was like two point one. So it was like the first episode of the second season. That episode, he said, he got to me so much. I left the gang. I went back to my mum, I begged for forgiveness, uh, she's accepted me, and I'm, <laughs> sorry, it's mad. And now he's on the, his second year studying law. <sighs> that, that's mad, bruv. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's, that's pretty crazy. And that's just one story. You know, I, I've got like at least... At least a few hundred. Sure. At least that... Um, and, and those are the told stories. Yeah, and... And yeah, and I, so I think that, you know, with doing these kind of things and, and, and you know, being part of the Creators for Change and, 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 and being able to be an ambassador and create content like that, you know, is, is truly amazing. And I think since the tools uh, and since the first, uh, you know, group of videos that I've done, like, I just feel like more, more inspired and more motivated to make, like, I always want to make people laugh. That's my forte. That's like what I, I, I believe I'm okay at. But, um, but if it has a nice message at the end, that's, that's really good, man. That's like, that's what kind of, I think I'm more like now driven to kind of make that kind of content. And like the one that I'm doing now, uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to, it's a short film. It's called Boys Don't Cry. I think that's what we're going to call it. So that's, it's just one short film. And it's just about toxic masculinity, about the fact that, you know, I feel like we, we grow up, you know, having that perception that men, you know, like, you know, I don't know if my mom was like, oh, boys don't cry, you know, like, you know, don't be a girl, you know, the sexist from her, you know, like, yeah. you know, like it's wrong for a guy to, to feel a certain way. And like when I was doing the bullying video, um, I was researching and I don't know if the stats are the same now, but it was basically around the fact that it was like 70% 70, 70 of, of people that commit suicide are men. And not only that, but um, I think suicide in, I think the UK, uh, and I, it might be different now, but I remember reading something like suicide in the UK is the biggest killer for men under 40. Yeah. I've heard and, so. and, and, and I, and I, and I realized that maybe that's because as men, we are kind of like, brought up in a certain way that we feel that we have to be a certain way and we feel like we maybe not be able to like you know turn to your mate and say i'm feeling really depressed i'm feeling down maybe it might be about being heartbroken yeah and, you know like you know i i've i've had i've even had heartbreak that's really changed my life but do i tell my friends no because i don't want them to think that i'm a you know what i mean you know it goes back to and, what we were talking about right at the start about again static senses of being whether it's where you live in terms of what gender you are mm. and like what your role is because my my parents were fortunately very like open and weren't very judgmental that's really good um, yeah. i mean one example i tell uh, and my, my brother's i was gonna say forgive me brother he hasn't got a choice now because i'm gonna tell it <laughs> but um when my little brother was born um my parents were worried that i was gonna feel like neglected yeah. so they bought me a little baby to look after yeah. and a, a little pram yeah. and i didn't use it and my brother then started looking after yeah, it yeah. and so we'd walk down the street and there's my brother with a, i think it was like a pink pram and yeah, stuff yeah. like that and my parents just didn't care because they were like it's what he wants to do and yeah, it, yeah. it was nothing like that and i, I look in hindsight and it was only in the last couple of years i really thought how much respect i had for that yeah. but when it when it comes to toxic masculinity i think the people that push back are worried that what we're saying is masculinity is toxic, which is not what we're mm, saying. Yeah, 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 All we're saying is there are toxic elements yes. that we need to talk about. And like all these other elements of life, of 
being a certain way for life. Yeah. There are people that think this is the way it is to be a man. Yeah, yeah. And now that's been challenged. It's like, so where is my place yeah, once yeah. more? Yeah, 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 and yeah. so it is a, a painful thing. And I think about when I was, at, especially at secondary school, I didn't feel like a lad. Yeah. Um, again, I'm going to, in a weird way, by not being a stereotype, I feel like I am stereotyping. But like, I wasn't that into sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't particularly, is it boisterous, the word? Um, yeah. But I just, I didn't really fit in in that way. And um it makes me think about like the way that we need to sort of talk about these things. Cause the truth is, although we kind of know the direction of travel, mm. we're still trying to work out what the best way of dealing with these things are, because as we start tweaking society yeah. and having conversations, new problems are going to arise yeah, yeah. and we might make mistakes along the way and yeah, cause yeah. more harm than good, but we should at least try. And yeah. I think that's sort of the big, the big, the big push we should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, listen, Thank you so, so much for coming down. No, th you know what? I've actually, I've never done like a proper podcast. This was so much fun. Right. You just talk and people are going to listen. Do you know what I mean? And, and the thing I've noticed, and I mentioned it beforehand, is kind of the first 10, 15 minutes feels like yeah, an yeah. interview because when you get asked questions, you have sort of in mind what an answer will be, but then it just opens up. But like, actually, ironically, based on a lot of the stuff we're talking about, nuance and sort of you know, being forgiving and realizing people have imperfections, this format kind of allows for us having those stories and realizing that we have all the time in the world to explain ourselves. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. when you do a video five minutes long, you'll, you'll make some points yes. and someone in the comments will go, oh, but what about this? And they may have misconstrued you or you want to respond, yeah. but then there's a massive chain of comments yeah, and it's yeah. like, no, 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 I didn't mean yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course there are going to be people that might pick on something that we said yeah. in this video, but I think the very nature of just having long conversations, it just humanizes the whole thing to realize that we just have ideas, we discuss it and we're willing to yeah. learn off each other. I think that's a great way to sum it up really. And I, I think, I mean, we're creating history. Like people, will, you know, the way we're evolving People will watch this and whether it will be a few years, five years, ten years time. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tomorrow. You know, yeah, tomorrow. And, 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 and we're creating history and we're like basically just talking about our stories, our mindset for, for now and, and, and the present. And, and, and yeah, and hopefully we can yeah do this again because this was super fun man i'm glad Thank you, you think so that. much yeah, yeah and, so, and, and that's so why and that's why i've called it the quest for global empathy because it's yeah. this idea of empathy is all about shared experience yeah and it's that no one has all the answers yep. no one even has all the questions and mm -hmm. so all we can do is just bounce off each other and you and i will definitely come away with some stuff we didn't think about before i definitely like have learned bots. from stuff for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. too uh yeah. the dogs on the bridge although not yeah. to bring that up again yeah uh 650 yeah, that's still <laughs> the dumbest thing ever if i heard that 649 people took their dog to a bridge and the dog died <laughs> i'm not gonna be like well it's not gonna happen again i hope no one listening What's to this the... podcast is gonna go oh i might go for all yeah no, no 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 we do not condemn no, that no no watch don't... the video don't yeah 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 absolutely yeah. But um, thank you so much, Hamza, for coming down. And uh, I'm really glad we got chatting through Creators of Change because it's been a great initiative. And uh, good luck with all your future projects. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. Cheers, dude. Love, man. Love. <laughs>